Oh, yeah, it is, it is working. Uh, how is everyone? Uh, we delayed a little bit this morning. There's lots of problems on the Jubilee line, so we've tried to hold back a little bit. Uh, but we can't hold back too long because we've got a packed schedule. Uh, so I'm just going to say a couple of uh, uh, sort of introductory remarks. Welcome to Level 39. Um, uh, hopefully some of you have been here before, but obviously uh, a very interesting location uh, in terms of uh, the companies that are based here, about 200 fintechs. Um, and also welcome from UCL School of Management. So this conference is over two floors in two days. So we've got the main floor up here, and then there are a series of workshops and the sort of booths for sponsors downstairs. Um, so my name's Alistair Moore. I teach uh, on the business analytics program at the School of Management. The School of Management is fairly new in terms of UCL. Uh, it came out of um, sort of a department for uh, management science and innovation. Uh, and this year we just started our first MBA program. And the school itself has a focus on uh, sort of innovation, analytics, entrepreneurship, the sort of uh, newer uh, specialisms in terms of uh, management science. Uh, the program that I teach has been running for a couple of years now. And it's sort of introductory machine learning and a very wide variety of applications. If I think back over the last uh, sort of 10 years, my background is obviously a sort of signal processing type uh, agenda, and I now find myself in the School of Management. And I think the interesting thing is, whilst there are some you know, definite improvements, in, you know, particularly in terms of availability of compute and the sort of tool chains, the engineering of some of this machine learning type activity has become a lot easier in recent years. Right? If I cast my mind back even five or six years ago, some of the leading you know, people working in neural networks will have still been mucking around uh, in MATLAB on one machine. Uh, and now there's a whole host of tools coming on stream to make this stuff a lot easier. And I think one of the interesting things is the variety of applications that are possible. Um, even for sort of low-hanging fruit that don't need bleeding-edge technologies. If I look at the student projects that we've done over the last few years, we've got everything from uh, working, predicting insurance premiums based on the performance of directors through to uh, looking at uh, marketing spend for artists look, uh, off streaming sites through to retail applications, looking at footfall. And so there are a very broad number of places where some of this uh, new emerging technology will work. And I think there's not enough focus on uh, the real world applications and how to actually take some of the stuff that's working uh, at scale in three or four of the larger tech companies and looking at all the different places where it can be applied. And hopefully this is what Papis will do. We'll show a very broad range of different applications for some of these technologies. And with that, I hope you enjoy the two days. And I hand you over to Louis, who's going to tell you all about what is actually going on. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Alistair. I work with Alistair also outside of Papis. I co-teach one of the modules at School of Management. Um, and I run these conferences, the Papis conferences, with uh, other people that you meet uh, during the conference. Um, I also help people get started with uh, machine learning and things. And I watch uh, series, TV series. I'm a big fan of, uh, d does anyone know Piper? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Silicon Valley. Uh, I guess several of us are, and uh, if you if you also fan, there's a, a Piper Peace T-shirt to grab downstairs for some of you. Uh, we don't have that many, but we have some. Uh, we love funny T-shirts. Uh, we love spoofs, and uh, that was the poster for the last conference we did in Boston. Uh, what is really nice is that I'm seeing some faces that uh, of people who are in Boston. Uh, so it's very good to see that people are coming back to our conferences. There's also a few of you who were at our previous event in Europe that was in Valencia in 2016. Uh, so yeah, very happy to have you with us again. Uh, that's the poster for this edition. Uh, maybe a little bit harder to understand, but if you've seen Die Hard, then uh, you probably know what I mean. If you haven't, uh, watch it tonight. Um, so yeah, EPKI, my friend. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Die Hard, and yeah, I thought that the the tower, the Nakatomi Tower, kind of looked like the Canary Wharf Tower. So that's where it started from. Uh, no, I think that was Brice's idea. Where's Brice, anyways? Um, and yeah, that's what he says. And uh, it sounds kind of like EPKI. So yeah. 
the other sort of spoof that we have is this one, uh, where basically uh, we replaced machine gun with machine learning, and there you go. Uh, also available downstairs. <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of things that are available downstairs. All right, there's Wi-Fi both here and below different networks. So below is UCL School of Management, so different network. Um, all the practical information, Wi-Fi and so on, is available on the mobile app. So you can, if you didn't have time to catch that, um, try to connect via 3G or 4G, and then you'd be able to find it from the, the mobile app. Um, this is where we are on social media. Obviously, I'm giving you the Wi-Fi network so that you can connect and tweet about the conference, right? So that's the hashtag to use. Um, and yeah, I mentioned the mobile app. This is what it looks like. Oh, wait. This is what the website looks like on your mobile. So just go to pepees.io, click on that thing at the top, and then that's the sort of uh, mobile view of the schedule, which you can personalize. Um, you can add that to your home screen. And I think that would be way more practical than having paper schedules. I know that people still want to have paper schedules sometimes, but we're trying to go paperless. Um, and you should be able to log in via the um, oh, using the email address that uh, you registered from. But, um, right, I'm just going to skip that video. But basically, that's where you'll find everything, including that practical uh, info page, which I think is available in the menu if you click on the top left icon. Yeah, you'll find it. Um, cool, so level 38 is just below us. Uh, as I said, that's where you'll find some of our cool t-shirts. Uh, that's also where our expo area is, so that's where you'll be able to um, meet and speak with uh, some of our sponsors, but also some of the uh, startups that are pitching and that are participating in this startup competition in our AI startup battle. Um, T-shirts, lunch, all right, that's a good reason to uh, get the lift down to level 38. Uh, drinks in the evening, another very good reason. And um, right, there's a third track, there's two tracks going on here, so this is like the main room. And there's another room just behind. The third track is downstairs, and that's where you'll find the product workshops and tutorials. Uh, and if we're running out of uh, tea and coffee during the breaks, uh, you can find more downstairs as well. Videos. Uh, this is being filmed. So, hi, YouTube. Uh, I don't know how many people are on the stream. Maybe not that many. But uh, live streaming and video recording, right? So, uh, if you... If you're not sure about which talk to attend, go to another room, not this one, because this is being filmed, so you should be able to catch up by just going to YouTube. Uh, if you can't remember that URL, just search for pepees.io on YouTube. And that's it. That's uh, all the wonderful people also who are supporting this conference, so many thanks to all of them. Um, these are the wonderful people who have put together the program of this uh, conference. So Alistair just said a couple of words. Um, and I'd like to, oh, Tom would be around at some point. Oh, Tom is here. Oh, great. And uh, I'd like to hand over to Florian, uh, who was one of our program chairs, to tell you a little bit more about today's program. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Louis. So I'm responsible to give you an outline of today's program which is a big task. And so today the weather should be sunny. And on the <laughs> <laughs> so uh, t today would be about uh, industry and startup and fun, obviously, whereas tomorrow would be about uh, machine learning and research and fun, obviously, too. So today we'll start with a main track in this room until the coffee break, 10.30. Then we could split with here the session you've got downstairs on level 39, which would be most, mostly workshops. Then on the morning, you would have to choose between creative AI, kind of uh, generative design and so on, and uh, machine learning in production. That's a tough, tough choice. But you will have to choose between this room and the room back to you for those two tracks, possibly. And in the, uh, in the afternoon, we'll have some uh, machine learning on the trench and organizational changes for machine learning. Again, this track is here in this room, and this track is in the room behind you. 
Then we've got coffee again and uh, startup pitches, AI startup battle, and uh, investor stuff and drinks. Tomorrow we start again with the main track until until uh, coffee coffee break with uh, lots of uh, demos. Then we uh, again have uh, two tracks in parallel. One would be uh, mostly tools and uh, demos. So if you want to have a good overview of uh, all uh, the possible tools around, that would be the track to follow. Otherwise, you have more like a research track around uh, uh, feature engineering and uh, data transformation, leveraging machine learning, and so on. And then in the afternoon, again, three tracks in parallel. Uh, one would be uh, about uh, applications of machine learning in several fields, including uh, image. One focusing more on uh, distributed on um, on uh, deep on uh, on uh, deep learning, and again workshops and tutorial uh, on level 38. And then, unfortunately, at some point, you will have will have to 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 quit the conference and get back to your home for your weekend. So that's it. And um, thank you. Uh, I guess. You should probably introduce our first speaker. <laughs> uh, our first speaker is Olivier Grisel. He is, uh, I'm always saying that hey, Olivier is a big contributor to Scikit-Learn, and uh, he does a bunch of other things. Um, and um, he's involved in a spin-off of INRIA. INRIA is one of the big contributors to Scikit-Learn. I'm repeating Scikit-Learn because you know there was this uh, report that uh, France made on AI, and I think that they completely missed Scikit-Learn. But yeah, if you use Scikit-Learn, um, you use partly French software, French-made kind of. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, because they they didn't mention that in the report, uh, I thought it'd be good to mention it. <laughs> but yeah, we're very happy to have Olivier here, and uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Olivier Grisel to the piece. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my microphone is working. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone. So I'm a I'm a Scikit-Learn contributor. Uh, I work at uh, Inria uh, as a software engineer, uh, primarily on Scikit-Learn and also related stuff, uh, related open source uh, project basically. And today, uh, so this conference is, is about uh, managed hosted uh, services for uh, building and uh, deploying predictive models. And today I would like to, uh, to do the opposite, is that, that is uh, to set up your, your own infrastructure from scratch just uh, using uh, open source building blocks without using any, any service provider. <laughs> so uh, I will focus on uh, Dask, uh, Jupyter Hub, and uh, Kubernetes. So uh, Kubernetes, uh, how many of you have heard of, know what Kubernetes is? So half, a bit. Yeah. So it's basically uh, a cluster orchestration system, so uh, um, a system for configuring the deployment of services and applications on a cluster, on a distributed setup. It's based on containers, like Docker containers. Um, it makes it possible to manage distributed applications with several uh, replica, and also to schedule uh, batch uh, processing jobs that happen in the background on the same cluster. And they can share um, uh, compute resources, but also persistent storage. And there is some kind of um, uh, access control system uh, based on, a, on a role definitions. So it's a bit like an op operating system, but for a cluster, an operating system for several machines. And um, finally, you can deploy this uh, on-premises on your own machines if you set it up by yourself. Or you can also uh, provision uh, a pre-installed Kubernetes cluster on all the major public clouds. So uh, in this presentation, it's going to be mostly about how to uh, use uh, Kubernetes, and it's going to be uh, mostly about demos. So uh, the first demo, actually, it's, um, I wanted to, to see it here. Uh, I will uh, introduce how to use, uh, to set up yeah, to use a Dask and Jupyter Hub on a Kubernetes, and I will introduce uh, introduce uh, what, what is Dask. So here, nope, not this one. This one. Uh, so this is uh, my laptop uh, running uh, the dashboard, the, the Minikube dashboard, the Kubernetes uh, dashboard 
uh, running on the Minikube system. Minikube is a way to uh, set up a small Kubernetes cluster for deployment, for testing and deployment on, on, uh, on your machine. Uh, does it run? doesn't run. OK. Um, <clears throat> and, and basically, you can see that here, uh, I just have uh, two services running. One is called Hub, and the other one is called Proxy. Uh, it's basically the, the Jupyter Hub that has been deployed. So Jupyter Hub is a, a HTTP interactive interface that makes it possible to, uh, to give your users access to their own personalized interactive environment for data science. So uh, in particular, you can configure Jupyter Hub to uh, use a user management system such as uh, GitHub, for instance. You could uh, log in with your GitHub credentials or uh, Google or OOS, or you can plug it to your own IT if you want. When you, once you log in, uh, you get access to your own Jupyter Lab environment. So here in the small terminal on the, on the, on the bottom, you can see that I'm also running in the background a command line uh, uh, command uh, to access Kubernetes directly and to see what are the programs, uh, the list of programs running on my cluster. Uh, so here I have Jup Jupyter Hub, the proxy, reverse proxy, and uh, my uh, Jupyter Lab session, my own personal uh, interactive session that has been open when I log in. It has been provisioned dyna dynamically. So uh, in this um, Jupyter Lab session, uh, I, I have a notebook, uh, and I will show you how to, to use uh, Dask to basically to execute computation on that Kubernetes cluster. So Dask has some integration uh, with native integration with Kubernetes. It, it, can, it can talk directly to, to the cluster. Dask, you can see it as a, an alternative to Spark, for instance, that is pure Python. Um, and it's also better integrated with NumPy and uh, Pandas, so if you want to do uh, linear algebra computation, it, it's uh, very nice. And it has also some uh, machine learning uh, tools. So if you use the kube cluster from Dask Kubernetes, basically, you can get a client object in Python uh, that will talk directly to the Kubernetes cluster. As soon as you start it up, you get basically a, a scheduler process that is running, and there is a, a dashboard page uh, dedicated for, for that uh, uh, um, uh, scheduler that is already uh, provisioned in the background. So I, I just had a, a problem with my port forwarding here, so I restarted the port forwarding. Uh, but uh, then uh, you should get uh, your dashboard up and running and see what is happening uh, from the Python point of view on the cluster, what, what Python programs are running on the cluster. So here at the beginning, there are, there are no workers running, but I, I can dynamically uh, ask to have at least two Python processes uh, minimum and a maximum of, of four. And it's a, an adaptive scheduling that will depend on the load, uh, how much compute I need in my program, in my Python code. And so when I click adapt, you can see here at the bottom that in Kubernetes automatically there are two new workers that have been provisioned, two new pods uh, running in containers. They automatically show up uh, uh, here. Uh, they are registered in the Dask scheduler automatically and you see that each of them has two cores, two threads. So in total for this uh, small laptop cluster, I have uh, two workers, two Python process and each of them has two cores. If I switch back to the status page on the, on the Dask scheduler view, I see that uh, there are 80 megabytes uh, allocated uh, for my Python process on the cluster. It's just the uh, empty workers with no data loaded so far. And you see that they are not doing anything. There is no task scheduled so far. Um, <clears throat> so once I have this, I can define uh, regular Python functions. So here the first function is called inc uh, for incrementing uh, x plus 1. But uh, I, I make it slow by uh, importing uh, random and, and slipping a uh, random time so that we, we can see the execution happening if it's not too fast. So we define in the increment inc plus 1, the function double that uh, double uh, the value of x and return it, and then a function that takes two arguments, add, that uh, does an addition of, of the two of them. Um, so those are regular Python functions. If I execute them in the Jupyter notebook, I just get the answer directly. Uh, but I can also uh, use my client object to, to talk to the cluster and to submit the execution of the inc function on the cluster by providing some arguments, some input data. So here the input data is just a single integer, it's one. And uh, when I get that, uh, instead of getting the result back, I get a future object. It's just a pointer to the result of the computation. 
And you see that by default, uh, I have a unique identifier for fetching back the results. Uh, but uh, by default, it's in status pending because it has just, be, it's just been scheduled. Um, because, uh, but if I refresh the, the state, it's very fast to execute. And you see that now it's in status finished uh, with, um, because it was uh, very easy to, to compute. The result was still in the cluster, but then I can fetch it back into my Jupyter environment by just calling the result uh, method. So it's just a, a way to to schedule uh, work on the cluster and uh, and not fetch back the result directly because then I can uh, uh, some put some more dependencies between the, the tasks. And this is an example. So here in, the, in this example, uh, I define a, a loop of our integers. And first, I will increment the integer by, by calling a first times uh, the submit function with the increment method. Then I will uh, get the result of that first increment and pass it to another function that will double it. And then those two intermediate results, I will combine them by an addition uh, uh, to get a z. And I will collect all the, the z value, the z variable value in a list. And uh, at the end, I will compute the sum of all the values. So, uh, and store that in a variable that is called total. If I do that, if I execute the cell, you can see that many of the operations can be parallelized. So all my four threads are, are being used uh, in parallel. And because I have set it up the adaptive computation, you see that there are additional workers that have been uh, provisioned dynamically on my Kubernetes cluster because the load uh, uh, in my scheduler queue was increasing. And uh, that speeds up uh, the, the computation. And as soon, um, as soon as it's complete, uh, because I said that I want just a minimum of two, maximum of four, automatically on the end of the computation, it will release uh, the compute resources that I don't use in, anymore. So if I switch to the graph tab here, you can see also that I see the dependency between my tasks. And I see in green the stuff that is processing. In blue, this is the stuff that has been uh, already computed and the intermediate result have been already reused, so we don't need to store it anymore. Uh, in red, we have the intermediate results that, are, that might still be useful for some other task in the future, so they are kept in memory on the cluster. Uh, <coughs> So you can see that the, 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 the memory usage of the cluster can increase over time because there are some uh, intermediate results that are stored on the workers that, that stay there because in your interactive session later, maybe you might need, need them. Um, and this is depending on the, on the local variable scoping of, uh, of, uh, of the main program. So automatically, you see that the two workers here are, have, um, have been released. The two additional workers that were dynamically provisioned, they already have been released. And so those resources can be shared with other uh, data scientists. We uh, maximally uh, uh, share, basically, the compute resources uh, very efficiently. Um, I don't know what it's stopping now, what I was supposed to do. So yes, here you see the, those uh, red values here are the values that are stored in, 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 uh, in the cluster. Those corresponds to the total variable in my program and the list of Z that I can potentially reuse later in my program. So here, instead of just computing the sum by, the, by doing a full, uh, a full sum of a list, what I can do is do a more efficient operation, which is called uh, all reduce in, uh, in HPC language, which is basically doing a tree reduction for the sum operation, an aggregation that will happen locally first between nodes, and then uh, the intermediate results are aggregated, so that the communications between the nodes is not uh, too high for a single node. And uh, we can parallelize uh, most of the aggregation, aggregation operation itself uh, using a tree structure, a tree dependency between the task. So this can be written in regular Python uh, using a while loop that will call uh, add on, uh, on two leaves of that tree and pro progressively storing the result and putting it back in, in the list of uh, uh, intermediate results. And as, as long as I have some intermediate result, I keep on uh, aggregating recursively like this. If I uh, execute this cell, Automatically, you see the, the tree structure, the dependency uh, that appears in the scheduler, and you say in green that some operations are already uh, being <coughs> scheduled and executed in parallel, and progressively it will uh, compute everything. And, and you see here my two workers, my two additional workers, the additive workload uh, has been provisioned uh, and uh, accelerates uh, the, the computation on, on the go. And finally, I have my final object that stores the result uh, of the sum. 
Uh, okay, uh, one more thing to say here is that here in my Python program I have some variables that point to the intermediate result here. If I delete those variables here, they are no longer needed in my program. So automatically uh, Dask tracks this and uh, uh, will release the memory allocated on the cluster because uh, those intermediate results are not used anymore. So there are still some variables somewhere in my program <laughs> that has some dependency. I think it's the the, the previous total uh, computation that was still there. But as soon as I delete stuff here, automatically it frees the resources, the memory resources in the cluster. And furthermore, if I uh, shut down my program here, if I restart the, 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 the kernel here, um, <coughs> restart kernel, <laughs> yeah, click, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, automatically, uh, the, the workers that were allocated for this computation are terminated because uh, they, they are not needed anymore. So the, the resources is shared uh, efficiently with other data, data scientists that might be using the, the, the cluster. So this was the first demo. I have a, a second demo that is more about uh, machine learning. Uh, I will do it right now. Using scikit-learn. So. so basically you're using the same primitives on the same compute infrastructure, but this time we are going to use scikit-learn. Uh, so here again, is it running? Yeah. Uh, so here, here again, we set up Dask to communicate to uh, to the cluster as we did previously. Doesn't seem to run. Okay. So I set up the cluster connection. I allocate some workers. This time, I decide to to set a fixed number of workers, and and they will stay there uh, all the time. You see, they are very quick to provision uh, because the, the image of the container is already there on the cluster, so it doesn't need to download any uh, virtual uh, environment or whatever. It's already there, so you just need to start the, the workers. It's very fast to, to start up. So I have my four workers. Each of them has two cores, so uh, eight, uh, eight cores total. Uh, so now I'm going to use uh, scikit-learn uh, and uh, uh, joblib. So by default, scikit-learn for parallel uh, computation uh, it's only able to do single machine parallelism. For instance, if you do a random forest, you can train different trees in parallel. It can use either threads or uh, uh, multi-processes. And this is done by a component that is called joblib that is embedded directly in scikit-learn and that manage, uh, manages the threads and the processes. What is new in joblib in recent version is that now you can unplug the default multiprocessing backend and uh, make it talk to some external uh, compute uh, infrastructure like Dask uh, based uh, on top of Kubernetes, for instance. Um, so here in this example, uh, I will uh, do some traditional uh, machine learning experiments. So I will uh, generate uh, some uh, uh, classification data just uh, for, the, for the demo. So just a couple, uh, 1,000 uh, example. I will train test split to have a test set for the final evaluation. Um, and so here, this is the just 10-dimensional uh, data or 20-dimensional data, something. Uh, and it's a binary classification test. It's just a synthetic toy experiment. So um, I, I want to train a machine learning model in parallel. So here again, I have my, uh, my problem uh, with my port that has been. <laughs> OK. Uh, so uh, here I'm, I'm doing um, uh, training support vector machines, but I don't know which hyperparameters are the best. So we run a grid search for, to find uh, the best hyperparameters uh, between uh, two different kinds of kernels, uh, different value of the regularizers, the bandwidth of the, of the kernel. And I will just uh, import from scikit-learn the regular tools like uh, support vector machine SVC and grid search uh, CV. That's our regular scikit-learn uh, components. Uh, and if I would run the, the grid search traditionally, I will just call uh, grid search dot fit on X train and Y train, and that would run on possibly several cores, but on a single machine, not on the cluster. It will try to fit models for all the possible combination in, in that grid, and this is an embarrassingly parallel task, so it, it can use many cores or many, many uh, um, yeah, in parallel. Um, here, uh, I don't want to use my, uh, my local uh, machine. I want to use the, the, the cluster. So instead of uh, running uh, grid search fit X train Y train, I will use uh, uh, DaskML um, and the, the joblib uh, ability uh, 
of joblib to talk to Dask to run on the cluster. So maybe I can move a bit forward. So this is what is written here. Uh, um, so uh, here, and I have the same line as previously, grid search fit something, but, in, but previously I just import joblib and I wrap that line under this uh, joblib parallel backend dask. Basically I said joblib use dask uh, whenever you are below this, uh, this uh, block, inside this block. So do not use your traditional uh, uh, threads, use the cluster instead. And uh, if we execute this, automatically we'll see that uh, the, everything is scheduled on, on the clusters. Uh, at the beginning, there is some deserialization that is happening to load the data in memory. Uh, and then it's running very efficiently in parallel. And you see that the tasks are streaming on, on the fly. Uh, Scikit-learn is dispatching uh, new stuff to do. And uh, this is uh, sent uh, uh, to the Dask cluster and being run uh, in parallel. And the results of the evaluation of the models are collected so that then we can introspect them. And, uh, and you see so it's running on all the, the workers. So the results are in a, an attribute of the grid search object. Uh, this, I can wrap them in a pandas data frame uh, to, to be able to sort and to, uh, to display them uh, as a table in the Jupyter notebook. So here we sort the results by uh, the best uh, mean uh, cross-validation score across the different folds. So the best one has 95% uh, accuracy. And we can see uh, what are the values of, of the parameters uh, for, that, for that model. So it's uh, a RBF kernel model uh, with a gamma of 0 0.01, uh, C is, is some value, and you see that uh, all their models with different parameters have different scores. And here the different columns is for each individual uh, cross-validation split, we have all the values. So this is traditional grid search. Uh, the only difference is that we, we plugged it directly to, to talk to Dask. Uh, and then I get my best model. I can r uh, run some prediction on the true test set that I haven't used so far and compute the final test evaluation score. I see that it's 95%. It's uh, approximately the same as uh, the cross-validation score, so everything is fine. So <clears throat> this is uh, nice. Uh, the only uh, limitation here is that we are using uh, traditional scikit-learn directly, and scikit-learn has been written to use NumPy and Pandas as input data structures. And so it means that scikit-learn expect the data to fit in memory on a single machine. So if your data is larger than this toy data set that I used here, which just were <laughs> a couple of thousands of samples, uh, uh, in today's machine you can fit uh, several gigabytes of data in RAM, so it's not that a limitation in practice, but uh, if your data doesn't fit on a single machine because it's, it's too, uh, too large, uh, then uh, this uh, simple use of scikit-learn, even if you use Dask, uh, we will not uh, cut it. So what you need for running on large data that doesn't fit on a single node on the cluster is some algorithm that is able to stream the data directly and is able to use an input data structure uh, that is not completely materialized in memory on a single node. So here we are going to use a Dask data structure instead of NumPy. And, and to do that, we are going to use a, a, a machine learning library which is called Dask ML which is basically some kind of wrapper of scikit-learn, but uh, it's reusing internal building blocks, primitives of scikit-learn, but it's working with different kinds of data structure. And uh, one of them is the Dask array, which is basically a chunk NumPy array, where e each chunk is stored on a different worker on, on the cluster. And it can be fetched uh, lazily from the data source, from the disk, for, from uh, S3 or for a database. Uh, and basically it's just a logical representation of a very large array that wouldn't fit on any of the machine. And you see that uh, there are, uh, I think, 10 million or 100 million, I think it's 10 million uh, records, and uh, each chunk has 1 million records. The total is still uh, very small, it's just uh, 100 megabytes. Uh, but uh, this data structure is chunked now, so it, it, it can be made sc uh, scalable to many machines. But because I'm running a small demo on my laptop, I didn't want to. <laughs> to try on a terabyte of data. Uh, so now that we have this data structure, we need algorithms that are able to work in parallel on all the chunks, and we also need uh, a specific implementation that accepts this kind of chunked arrays. Uh, so here we have uh, in DaskML, for instance, for clustering, we have the k-means algorithm. Uh, the only difference with the traditional k-means algorithm, it's not using uh, k-means plus plus for the initialization, it's using k-means parallel, which is some kind of uh, uh, approximation that runs in parallel on different chunks. 
And so this has been implemented in DeskML, and, uh, and uh, we can try to, uh, to, to use it on this uh, chunk data. So if we execute it, we can see uh, that uh, this has many uh, intermediate uh, steps. So you see different colors for all the different operations. The red here is for communication of the initial data uh, to the nodes. And then you see the, the task for, for the initialization, the k-means parallel uh, initialization. And uh, after this first step of uh, uh, dispatch uh, of computation, we have the, the true uh, k-means algorithm uh, that is also, uh, can, can be also be computed in parallel. And you see that some, from time to time, you have a vertical line uh, where there is nothing happening on the workers. It's basically intermediate results that have been fetched back to the driver program. And the driver program will compute some uh, aggregate statistics and, and, and send back additional, uh, a new iteration uh, of the algorithm that can be uh, chunked into parallel operations. And here you see also each of the individual tasks and you see the iterations of the algorithm for each uh, iteration, you have a batch of tasks that have been uh, uh, deployed here. Uh, so at the end uh, of the convergence uh, of uh, this model, uh, what is interesting is to see the profile tab. So here again, I had a problem with my network, so <laughs> the profile tab was slow to display. Uh, but um, you can see that the attribute uh, label here uh, uh, is actually not a NumPy array as would have been the case in scikit-learn. It's also a Dask array. Uh, it, it means that the results are, are not materialized back to the driver. They are still on the cluster and can be lazily fetched uh, upon request uh, back to the driver if we need them. If we don't need them, there is no point in fetching them back ahead of time. They might be big. So we keep them on, uh, on, on the cluster. But if we want to use a matplotlib to visualize uh, the label uh, of the clusters, what we can do is just take a subsample. And subsampling is just a slice object that we pass to this dask array to fetch just a subsample uh, of elements and do visualization of that. So it's much more efficient. We don't need to, fe to fetch back all the results. We can just fetch uh, very efficiently a small subsample. And finally, I think my uh, profile tab works in the end. I will just skip forward. Yeah. Uh, just here. Uh, on the profile tab, what is interesting is that we, you have a timeline of all the execution that have seen, uh, been executed in the past. You can see the CPU usage at the bottom. And you, you can select uh, a chunk uh, uh, of uh, that uh, timeline. So for instance, here, that was the first computation that we did with the support vector machine. And here you have a flying graph to see wh what, which functions were expensive. So here you can see that most of the time during that section was uh, spent in the dense fit uh, function from a libsvm that is used internally uh, in, in scikit-learn. So uh, fitting the support vector machine model was what was important. And it's being called by support vector machine, by cross-validation, by job lib. You can see the, the, the stack uh, the stack of coal uh, naturally in, in, that, in that view by going down. And here you see that there is another operation that takes some time. So it's actually computing the prediction for the support vector machine to compute the cross validation score. And so you can see the ratio between fitting and predicting. Here, if I move below in the timeline, I see the initialization of the k means parallel algorithm. And I can see which function in Python have, be, have been called. So you completing Euclidean distances. And here I select another uh, block, and it's actually the, f the, the final convergence of the k means algorithm, and you see that it's computing uh, pairwise distance, distances and taking the, the mean value to the closest centroid in, in that space, which makes sense, which is the, the cost-sensitive uh, operation in, uh, in k means. All right, so I think I'll stop here for the demo. Um, So, I don't know any of the timing. We, we have time for questions. Okay. We always have time for, for questions. That's one of the things that, you know, we want to make different from some other conferences. <laughs> but yeah, time for questions. Um, while we take questions, we might need to, our next talk is actually a demo involving some exotic hardware. Do you want to start setting up? No. Or is, is, you're fine. Okay, cool. Um, let's go with questions. Yeah. Yeah. So just there are some references uh, if you if you if you want to set it up. Yeah, some documentation and the slides uh, and videos have been tweeted uh, on my.
we talk Hi, about. Olivia. Thanks for the nice talk. So uh, how would you compare Dask with uh, PySpark, yeah. which is kind of the dominant platform, and, and now it has Kubernetes native support since 2.3? Yeah. So, uh, so since the last uh, version of Spark, you have also the same kind of uh, Kubernetes integration that I've de I demonstrated for Dask. The, the main difference is that Dask is pure Python, uh, so it's more lightweight uh, to install, to set up on, on your machine, uh, just using Anaconda. If you, if you want a single machine operation, it's very easy. And so the same program is very easily uh, scaled down back to one machine, to the single machine. So for debugging, uh, you can use the regular debugger from Python, which is not the case with, not necessarily the case with PySpark because you have a, a, a sandwich of Python, Scala, Scheduler, and uh, uh, Python workers, which makes it harder to uh, understand uh, when you are just a regular Python data scientist uh, with no uh, uh, Scala expertise. If you are a Scala developer, I think uh, Spark is uh, very nice too. Uh, there is another um, uh, difference is that uh, um, a Dask has more uh, as a, a Dask array data structure for uh, n-dimensional arrays, like general numpy arrays, which is very good for people working not necessarily with tabular data, uh, like uh, data frames, but with uh, uh, geoscience data, for instance. And there are also libraries like X-Array, which is some kind of generalization of pandas for uh, and dimensional data, uh, and that is very useful for for uh, geoscience uh, people uh, studying uh, cl uh, climate change, for instance. And there is actually a, a demo of this on uh, pangeopydata.org, which is basically the same kind of setup with Jupyter Hub that I've demonstrated today, but with PyArray and plugged on the Google Cloud uh, uh, infrastructure. And you have access to geoscience data, and you can see the, the kind of workflow that you can use uh, in, in that case. So I would say it's more versatile towards more uh, general computation and not just necessarily uh, traditional de tabular data science. No Amazing presentation, thank you. Um, can I ask another what's the difference question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the difference between uh, Kubernetes and um, Docker Swarm? Uh, so Docker Swarm is basically the orchestration layer for the Docker that was developed by the same developer as the Docker container itself. Um, and uh, so basically Kubernetes was implemented by other people, uh, initially by people from Google, but now it's a very uh, wide community, open source community of contributors. It's just that the adoption of uh, Kubernetes was much faster than uh, Docker Swarm. I would say. Uh, nowadays, uh, I think even the Docker company, uh, they are uh, providing Kubernetes uh, as, a, as a service, uh, managed Kubernetes. So I, I think it's just in terms of adoption, uh, Kubernetes was faster to pick up a very large community. And maybe it was r ready earlier to be production ready uh, compared to Docker Swarm, which uh, maybe took more time to be in a, in a stable position. Uh, but they are very similar. It, Docker Swarm and Docker Compose might be easier to, uh, to use from a developer point of view. Uh, they are easier to learn. Uh, Kubernetes to, to set up, it's maybe slightly more complex, but it's also the feature set. There are many, many plugins for different kinds of storage, different uh, GPU support, whatever. There are a ton of stuff. Uh, and they are supported with all the major clouds and by default by Google Cloud and uh, Azure as hosted services and I think Amazon is going to provide this also. Any other questions? Let's show us a couple of hands over there, no? You guys getting shy or? Um, okay, I'll, I might ask one. What's, uh, so in the sort of idea of making these things easier to use, mm -hmm. what's coming next? according to you? Um, so for, for, so, the, so to, to set it up, it's, uh, it's kind of complex. complex. Uh, it, it could be made e easier, but if you use hosted services like Google, uh, it's already quite, uh, quite easy. Uh, something that uh, I didn't show here uh, is that I, I just demonstrated interactive setup which when you train model, uh, you should not uh, do everything in a Jupyter notebook because for maintenance is uh, really not a, a good idea. Uh, so if you want to, to do a batch training of many models on a regular basis, uh, it might be better to use a batch processing system. And uh, if you want to do that with Python and Kubernetes as the compute infrastructure, you can use open source project like uh, Polyaxon, which is quite new also. 
Um, I haven't had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, use it extensively so far, but uh, uh, have a look at this. It's just a command line interface, a bit like a Floyd Hub, uh, but that you can host yourself, basically, uh, where you can define in a YAML file uh, the parameter of a grid search, uh, run compute on uh, GPUs using TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever, scikit-learn, if you want. And there is also Kubeflow, which is the similar kind of setup. It's more for interactive development, I think, uh, using Jupyter Hub and TensorFlow together. It's packaged uh, uh, in a specific way. Um, so I think it's more like the, the open source uh, developer community uh, is, is uh, slowly uh, integrating Kubernetes and making it n uh, a native component of all those libraries. Like uh, we said for Spark, it was uh, since the last release. Now with Dask, it's also integrated in, in this uh, Dask Kubernetes uh, component. And I think more and more projects will naturally work uh, on Kubernetes rather than working on a single machine. Cool. Uh, I think we actually have a couple more open source machine learning related talks that mention usage of Kubernetes. Uh, that should be today. Um, seeing Google Cloud just reminded me that we were supposed to have a Google Cloud tutorial, but there was an issue with the speaker coming to London. Actually, quite a few speakers have had issues coming to London, uh, visa issues and other issues. I'm not sure what's going on. But anyways, uh, that, uh, that's not happening. And there's a couple of speaker changes also. So there's only one talk so far that uh, is being canceled. It's the Google Cloud one. The other ones are still here, but there might be a couple of speaker changes. The last up-to-date information is on the mobile app. Uh, but, um, all right, let's thank Olivier for this great demo. Okay. Our next speaker um, this morning is Julien Simon. Julien is AI and machine learning evangelist at AWS and um, for the whole of uh, EMEA, Europe, Middle East. And... Um, Julien also is one of the few people in Europe who has <laughs> this uh, great t-shirt. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Who has uh, one of these deep lens devices. Did I spoil it? No, yeah, it was in the title. No, it's, it's there. Um, <laughs> it's right here. Uh, so really excited to see <coughs> how that works, uh, what's under the cover, what you can do with it. And uh, yeah, let's welcome Julien on stage. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Julian. I figured we would have enough uh, geeky t-shirts, and you can't have a, any conference with a heavy, without a heavy metal t-shirt, so there. Uh, and we have way too many French people in the room today. What's going on? Why don't we do this in Paris, then? No Next edition? Issues. Yeah, no visa issues in Paris. Um, OK, so um, my talk will, uh, will focus on uh, trying to do machine learning and deep learning at the edge. Uh, at the edge means outside of data centers. Oh, yeah, sure. Slides. Who needs slides? Here we go. Yeah, a little bit like that. Are we good? Not yet. Not yet. Is this, oh, that's the wrong cable, come on. That's the problem of bringing your own gadgets, too many cables here. This should be the right one. Here we go. Yeah, all right, we're good. Okay, so should I start again? No. Um, so I'm going to talk about deep learning at the edge, which means running uh, machine learning and deep learning prediction outside of uh, the typical environments where you would run them. Um, literally anywhere, right? So I've got my camera here. Hopefully it's going to work. It won't have any uh, technical issues today. We'll see. If, if I have technical issues, we'll figure them out. Um, so why would we, what would we need to run deep learning at the edge? What would be the first maybe three, four things that we need to worry about in order to run this successfully. So probably the first thing we need is uh, to be able to experiment in the cloud. 
because obviously even if we want to deploy at the edge on cameras and, uh, and any kind of sensor, drones, etc., we still need to work with data sets in the cloud. And we need to train at scale, okay? Uh, if we work with sm smaller data sets, uh, we can work locally, we can work on some servers in, in the closet, that's fine. If we are talking about uh, terabytes, maybe petabytes of images, video, sound, voice, etc. You know, we tend to think, and our customers tend to think, they need scalable infrastructure, and the cloud will give them that. Um, of course, one of the challenges of uh, running deep running at the edge is that these devices tend to be very, very uh, tiny, right? They have small CPUs, they have little memory, they don't have a lot of storage, so we can't take for granted the fact that uh, whatever model we run in the cloud on powerful GPU servers, uh, is going to run just fine on a Raspberry Pi or on an on Intel uh, Atom CPU, just, the one, just like the one in this camera. So we need to worry about performance, right? We don't want to wait 20 seconds to predict, say, uh, a single image. And of course, the last thing uh, that we need to worry about is deploying all that stuff, okay? When you deploy to, uh, to uh, your uh, uh, servers or your cloud environments, you used you know, CI, CD, and, and, uh, and Docker, and, and all kind of different uh, mechanisms to do that. And well, then guess what? They're not going to be available on, uh, on embedded uh, environments and, uh, and on devices like this. So deploying, updating code and model are going to be a concern. So let's look at these four different things. Um, so experimenting in the cloud. So as you probably know, uh, AWS has been uh, supporting the uh, Apache MXNet project for a while now. It's our preferred deep learning library. We use it to build our own services and we contribute to the project. And one of the reasons why we do that is because um, we feel it has the broadest uh, selection of languages. Um, if anybody in the room would like to use Perl to build deep learning models, raise your hand. Ah, you're ashamed, don't you? Right. You should be, uh, because probably you want to do Python, right? Uh, but if you wanted to do R, if you wanted to do you know, C++ for uh, maximum performance, Scala, et cetera, these are available. And this is, we see this as an advantage over, um, uh, over other libraries, and we can't expect all our customers to use a single language. Uh, recently, this uh, MXNet project introduced a new API called Gluon. Uh, initially, the MXNet programming model is a symbolic model. So you define the network using symbols, uh, you compile those symbols into a graph, you optimize the hell out of it, and then you train it and you predict. So that's great, gives best, the best performance. Uh, that's the way TensorFlow works as well and others. Uh, but the problem is that um, your, your training process tends to become a black box. It's very difficult to, uh, to inspect it, to stop it, to debug it, to change it because it's been optimized and doesn't look like your initial model anymore. So the Gluon API uses imperative programming, so you can actually define by run uh, your, uh, your model. You can use the Python debugger if you want to. You can stop the training process. You have full control over the training loop, et cetera, et cetera. So it's generally you know, code, uh, which is fine, and, uh, and you can work with it just like you would work with any, uh, any other piece of code. And uh, another thing we, um, we like in MXNet is the extensive model zoo. Um, especially, there's a large collection of uh, computer vision models, um, which are likely to be popular applications for edge devices. And they've been pre-trained. Uh, you can use them uh, as is, or you can fine tune them, obviously. And in this collection, uh, which I believe is the biggest I've seen so far, uh, you'll find some, uh, some good models like MobileNet, SqueezeNet, DanceNet, et cetera, that work pretty good on the, pretty well on resource constraint devices. So what about training? Uh, so you could train on, uh, on uh, CPU-based instances, like the C5 uh, uh, instances that we launched. Uh, you could, launch, you could uh, train on the GPU instances, the P3 with the latest uh, NVIDIA chips, the V100. And on those instances, you could build everything yourself, just fire up some instances, use the deep learning EMI, which is the Amazon machine image that we provide pre-installed with, um, I don't want to say everything, because we're always going to miss something, but uh, 
um, I would say most of the of the um, open source and, and machine learning and deep learning tools that you need out there. Okay, so you just fire up your server and within minutes you can get to work. But probably what you want to do if you need to train at scale is to use uh, this new service that we launched at reInvent a few months ago called SageMaker. Um, it just l lets you focus on the machine learning task and, and, and basically frees you of any infrastructure task. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter if you need to train on 100 instances. It doesn't matter if you need to deploy on 100 instances. It's just one API call away. All infrastructure is fully managed. Uh, and, uh, and you could just focus on improving the model, understanding the data, and, and do away with the plumbing. And, uh, and we tend to see infrastructure as plumbing. Now, once you have a model, um, what about uh, running that model at the edge? So what about speed, right? It's all about speed in the end, and accuracy, I guess. Um, so MXNet is natively written in C++. So it's, I would say, as fast uh, as possible. So even though, uh, even if you use the Python API or the, um, uh, the, the, the Scala API, in the end, you end up calling highly optimized C++ code. So you don't, you don't waste too much performance by using those uh, high-level languages. If you use Gluon, um, you can hybridize the, the models. So you can actually compile your, your, uh, your models into symbolic form, which, which again, which lets, will, let, will let MXNet um, optimize um, memory, optimize performance, and you get really, really close to native performance when you do that. So um, that's a thing that I see a lot of customers doing. They use Gluon, the flexible part of Gluon, for experimentation. And then when they have a working model and they just want to squeeze every uh, possible bit of performance out of it, they just hybridize it, which is just one API call that compiles it into that optimized representation. And they don't have to rewrite anything, okay, which is a shame. Because, again, I, s I used to see a lot of people maybe experimenting in Python and, just, and then having to rewrite everything in C++ using potentially different libraries, which is always a risk um, and, and time consuming as well. So here, you don't have to do that. Uh, you can uh, throw a couple of uh, performance oriented libraries into the mix, uh, like uh, uh, MKL, the Intel library that uses uh, optimized implementations of math primitives, uh, specific instruction sets uh, like the Intel AVX, just to speed up uh, linear algebra, convolution, etc. Uh, there's also an open source library called NNPack, uh, which is similar, and uh, it also works on uh, ARM-based architectures, such as Raspberry Pis, uh, which I love dearly, so I want to point that out. And uh, one cool technique that you can also use in MXNet is called mixed precision training, and uh, basically you're going to use 16-bit uh, uh, weights and activations instead of 32 bits, and that gives you two benefits. The first one is obviously that the model will be twice smaller, which doesn't really matter when you deploy on big servers, but it does matter a lot when you have to download it to uh, tinier devices over potentially unreliable networks. And uh, of course, 16-bit uh, 16 arithmetic is going to be quite faster than 32-bit arithmetic. So y you'll get a performance boost as well. So mixed precision training is a very cool technique, and there's hardly any loss of accuracy. So uh, pretty interesting, even in the cloud space, I would say. So now what about deployment once we have a model? So, you know, ideally, I think this would go like this. So you would train a model in SageMaker. You could train at scale in the cloud using your favorite environment, TensorFlow, MXNet, Scikit-Learn, uh, bring your own, do whatever you want there. Uh, you could bring your own model that you trained uh, on your own servers as well, of course. Um, you would write a Lambda function, okay? Um, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with Lambda. Lambda is, a, is our uh, function as a service service um, that we launched, believe it or not, in 2014. And uh, this lets you deploy uh, tiny pieces of code into the cloud on fully managed infrastructure which, without having to worry about scaling and, and anything else. So you would write that Lambda function, and what would it do? Well, it would just grab, uh, grab some data from... Um, um, uh, from, from your device and from, uh, we'll see an example with the camera, maybe a video frame or something. And it would run it through uh, your uh, deep learning model to, and perform prediction, right? And, and maybe send back some results to the cloud or change the video feed, etc. 
um, you would add both the lambda function that you wrote and the model that you trained as resources in a service called Greengrass. So Greengrass is an IoT service that we released a, a while ago that lets you deploy code uh, to, uh, in, in the form of Lambda functions, code to edge devices. Okay, and you'll see an example in a minute. So a Greengrass group is just at least one device, obviously. It could be a collection of devices. And you can attach code, a, pieces, a piece of code and a model to the group and then Greengrass will do the deployment automatically. Okay, and that's what it will do. So on the device, like this one here, uh, we have a, a small Greengrass SDK that connects to the cloud and, and gets uh, code updates and model updates automatically. And it doesn't matter if you're deploying to one device or a thousand devices, it's just going to work the same. So it really solves the deployment problem, which when you work with embedded uh, uh, systems it is always a nightmare. So this is a good solution if you want to have the exact same programming model in the cloud and at the edge, right? You just want to write code that you can test in the cloud and then deploy seamlessly to your edge devices using the same, exact same code, exact same technology. Um, if you need to update code and models often, okay, um, which, you know, which is likely, I guess, um, then Greengrass is a, good, is a good solution because it's going to handle it's, it's going to handle deployment, it's going to handle retries, it's going to handle everything. So it, it's going to help you solve maybe network, the fact that network connectivity is not there all the time or unreliable, et cetera, et cetera. It's just going to do that for you, okay? Um, the requirements, obviously, is that the devices should be powerful enough. So I would say it's hard to give exact uh, guidelines. Um, I would say anything smaller than a Raspberry Pi is, might be challenging, okay? If you have a smaller model, um, then you might be okay. Um, but I would say anything much smaller than one gigahertz clock speed and, and one gigabyte of RAM or maybe 512 megabytes of RAM is going to be, is going to be difficult. But no, it doesn't mean impossible. And of course, you need to provision the devices in, in uh, AWS IoT. Uh, you need to create a certificate for, uh, and, and a key pair for authentication encryption, et cetera. Security is important. So um, a, 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 just a few months ago, actually, we introduced a new revision to, uh, to Greengrass. Uh, it's called Greengrass ML. Uh, it's still in preview, but you, you can join it. So the way this works is actually pretty simple. Um, you have a Greengrass uh, device with the Greengrass SDK installed. It's, uh, it's connected to the cloud every now and then. And, uh, and whenever needed, the cloud is going to push a new model and a new Lambda function, okay? So whenever you update the code in the cloud, it will get pushed to your devices. And same thing for the model, okay? The difference here is that you can deploy them separately, okay? Previously, you actually had to combine the code and the model, which I guess was inconvenient because every time you needed to change one single line of code, you had to deploy everything again. So if you had a 100 megabyte model, you know, that's a, that's a big download just to change one line of code. So now you can actually manage those separately. Uh, and uh, the, the Greengrass framework on the device will uh, fire up the Lambda function and it's going to run some predictions. Okay, so you know, it's gonna loop forever uh, and, uh, and run some predictions using the model, everything happening locally, and then results, insights, predictions, however you wanna call the, those. Can, can be, they don't have to, but they can be sent back to, uh, to the AWS cloud uh, using IoT, uh, IoT messages, why not? Okay, so this is, uh, this is Greengrass. So let's take a quick look. Okay, so this is the, the yeah, I think it's large enough. This is the Greengrass console here. Uh, so we see two groups. Uh, one of them is a Raspberry Pi sitting at home. And the other one is my camera sitting down there. Okay, so let's look maybe at this one first. Um, so this, uh, this group is just a single Raspberry Pi. And uh, in, my, uh, in this group, I defined, I attached a Lambda function. So this Lambda function is just grabbing frames for the, from the Pi camera and running predictions. Okay, and I also defined uh, resources. So um, I can actually define hardware resources. So I can give access to my Lambda function to 
uh, in this case, the, the, the camera and the, and the memory of the camera on the Pi, so I can control that. Uh, if I had a GPU in there, maybe one day, uh, I could give access to that GPU as well, just make sure my resources are visible from the Lambda function. And then I can attach a model as well, okay? So uh, in this case, it's a, it's a squeeze net model. I could pick, um, I could pick a model so I could pick any, any model, basically, uh, from S3. Uh, or, of course, I could go and select a model that has been trained on SageMaker to make that, again, transition from the training environment to the deployment environment uh, super, uh, super simple. So just grab a model here, and, and that would get deployed, OK? Um, so here, um, we provide uh, uh, pre-built binaries for uh, for Raspberry Pis, uh, Jetsons, uh, NVIDIA Jetsons, and a third one that I keep forgetting about. Sorry about that. Uh, we provide pre-built binaries for uh, MXNet, et cetera, but you could really bring any, any kind of library. If you wanted to use Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow, uh, you could use the exact same mechanism. It's just that, uh, uh, of course, your Lambda function would have to uh, use the, the Scikit-Learn APIs or the TensorFlow APIs to do that, okay? And then, uh, you know, you can deploy this uh, as often as you want. And uh, if I had, a, let's say, a code update, I would just click on redeploy or call an API, obviously, and this would just uh, push um, the, the updated code and or the updated model to, uh, to my fleet of devices, okay? And if some of them are powered down or if some of them are um, unable to access the network, Fine, you know, uh, we can try later. It's, uh, again, Greengrass is going to take care of that uh, complexity. So what about a real, a real gadget here? So at reInvent, we also launched um, Deep Lens. Come on, Deep Lens. Yeah. Yep, here you are. So um, it, it's, um, it's a camera. It's based on an Intel board. Um, it has a, a tiny, I hate to call it GPU, <laughs> a, let's say a, a graphical accelerator um, on, on that, uh, on that uh, board. So it, it has nothing to, you know, it does, it's, it's millions of light years away from, let's say, a big NVIDIA GPU, but it has a couple of hundred cores, uh, which, are, uh, which are good enough for our use case. Uh, so this is running Ubuntu, uh, and, uh, and of course it's pre-installed with Greengrass and everything we need to, uh, to play with it. So how does it work? Uh, so basically, we're going to do uh, pretty much what I showed you. We're going to uh, uh, create, uh, we're going to register the camera to, uh, to AWS. Uh, that will create a green grass group for the camera. And uh, we can attach Lambda functions, we can attach models, we can deploy them automatically. And then, of course, we can apply those models to the video feed, okay? Um, so you can take a closer look if you want uh, later on. Uh, but I guess we should just plug it in and, and start playing, right? So here we go. Um. All right. Okay, so let's see if I can type my password now. Wow, okay, amazing. Okay, so uh, as you can see, this is a vanilla Ubuntu. And um, so I c I've, I've got two HDMI connections here. One would give me the uh, original video feed and the other one will give me the, the feed that has been processed by the Lambda function. So I'm gonna jump to that one directly. And this looks like the right thing. Okay, so let's see if I can find more people here. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, the model that is deployed here is an object detection model. So don't be offended, but you are objects to, to this camera. Uh, one of the objects that, uh, that can be detected is actually people, okay? But, um, 
the, the font is really, really tiny, but it's actually able to pick up chairs. Um, so if anybody has a, a cat, a dog, or a sheep, should be able to pick those out as well, but I guess not, right? Louis wouldn't allow them. Uh, so chairs, uh, maybe bottles, and things like this. Uh, okay, but people work pretty well. Okay, so let me put this down again. You can come and, and take a closer look later on. So, so how does this work? So uh, again, um, I, w when you register the camera, you can pick from sample projects, okay? And this is one of the sample projects. We have obje object detection, face detection, cats and dogs. Uh, yeah, tr yeah, tr maybe, tr yeah, yeah, fine. I'm all for testing. Uh, cats and dogs, what does it say? It says bottle, sir. Yeah, yay deep learning. Um, yeah, well. That's the thing, it, it has only 20 things to pick from, so you know, it, it's unlikely it's gonna say sheep, right? But you never know, right? If I filmed any of you and it said sheep, I'd be embarrassed. Um, so uh, we, we can do activity detection, et cetera. So you can, I'll just show you the console uh, afterwards. Um, but you can just select one of those sample projects and, and deploy them in minutes, okay? But of course, what you want to do is to train your own models. Okay, you want to build your own project. And actually, we, we run, we gave away a few, uh, a few hundred of those uh, at, uh, at reInvent, and, um, and uh, we, run a, we run a hackathon, and, uh, and people came up with pretty funny stuff. So that's the idea, really, uh, to let people train and, uh, and, and build fun apps. So let me show you a quick example here. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's look at the lambda function, for example. Okay, so this is the lambda func uh, the lambda console, and so this is the actual code that's running on the camera for for this model. So basically, we have a function um, that's going to run forever. Okay, as soon as the as the the function starts up, uh, it's going to do this. So um, it knows about twenty different types of objects. See, so uh, buses and cars and okay things that are not necessarily easy to fit in a in a conference room but still um, and then we're just going to grab uh, we're just going to grab a frame okay here okay so we're going to grab a frame from the camera uh, we're going to resize it to whatever input size the model needs I think it's uh, 300 300 uh, we're going to run inference, and uh, and using the predictions, then you know we use OpenCV to to draw uh, bounding boxes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so there's actually a bit of magic happening here uh, because we're not running MXNet per se on the camera. We're running um, a tool called the uh, Intel Inference Engine. Okay, and the Intel Inference Engine is actually it's a prediction. Uh, layer that has been super optimized for Intel chips. Okay, so there's a conversion step uh, when you actually uh, download the model to the camera, and this is done automatically on the first call of do inference. Uh, so whenever you actually call this on a new model for the first time, it's going to be optimized within a few seconds to that Intel uh, 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 format, and this is what is running on the camera, so it's, it's fusing some layers and it's, again, applying some hardware optimization just for extra performance, basically, okay? But now uh, it's all taken care of. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you don't have to worry so much about that. Okay, so this is the uh, under the hood look. And yeah, we, s we use OpenCV and just for fun, uh, we can publish uh, we can push an IoT message back to uh, the AWS cloud saying, okay, this is what I found. And you could store this in uh, any kind of backend to do analytics and, and, uh, and reporting and, and whatnot, okay? And yeah, so really quick, this is the, this is the Deep Lens console, so you can see the, the sample projects here, okay? 
and if you want to create a new project, uh, you would just do this. So basically, a project is a model and a function. So I could pick from one of the existing models, or I could just go and, again, grab one of the models that I train in SageMaker, or I could take a model living in S3, and that would be it. Okay, so again, no, uh, no disruption between training and prediction. Just train, grab the model, deploy it. Okay, and, uh, and of course, you, could, you would just add your Lambda function as well. And, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so it's, it's not, not too complicated. We have a bunch of blog posts um, on how to do this in detail. So ping me if you, uh, if you need more information. Okay, so, yep, we saw all of that. Okay, so yeah, that's another example, playing with my kids. Uh, same, I think it's the same model actually, it's the object detection model too. So, it worked pretty well. And you can see the chair and the sofa, and, and my laptop actually says TV monitor, which I guess is close enough. Pretty good. Okay, resources, and yeah. Try this with your cat and, and you'll pay for this. See, see my scratches? Uh, anyway, so uh, some resources to, uh, to dive deeper on all of this. Um, of course, the, um, the MXNet and, uh, and Gluon uh, web pages. Uh, I have to say, uh, this uh, specific Gluon URL uh, obviously has uh, the Gluon docs, but it has uh, a lot of uh, uh, generic uh, information on what deep learning is, how it works, etc., etc. So it's, a, it's actually a very good resource to learn about deep learning. Um, um, it, it's, it was written by one of my colleagues, and, and he did a, a really good job at this. Um, if you want to play with SageMaker, we have a, a free tier available, um, so you can, uh, uh, you can do that. If you need more information on SageMaker, and we had the San Francisco Summit actually yesterday, and we announced uh, even more things on SageMaker. Uh, we open sourced part of the platform, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want an overview on what it is, how it works, how you can leverage it to train and deploy your models at scale without managing a single server, um, I recorded a YouTube video that seems to be quite popular. So maybe you'll like it as well. Uh, if you're curious how SageMaker works, uh, we also have, the, uh, we have an SDK and samples on GitHub to show you how you would do, let's say, distributed training with TensorFlow or how you could bring your uh, R uh, a model to uh, SageMaker, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Greengrass, again, there's a free tier for it if you want to try it. Deep Lens, um, so you can't buy the device now. You have to pre-order it from Amazon.com. It should, should ship mid-June, crossing fingers. Uh, if you're curious about that Intel um, um, inference engine and what Intel does to uh, optimize uh, inference, uh, this is the link to go to. And uh, last but not least, I guess, uh, my blog on Medium where I tend to uh, post all kinds of things on uh, machine learning, deep learning, SageMaker, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're, uh, if you're into those things, then uh, you might enjoy my blog, okay? And don't do this to your cat, come on. Don't be, don't be mean. It said dog for 10 minutes until it said cat. So that's why the dog, yeah. So that's why it, it's pissed off. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Louis, thank for you, inviting Jim. me. And uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, um, same thing as before. Before taking questions, I'd like to invite up the uh, startups who are about to pitch, just to make sure that everything's set up in time, because yep. we're running a little bit late. But that doesn't mean we can't right. take questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Julien? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Yep. This is the one you need. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, great, uh, great presentation. I have a question about the pre-processing of the images, like, like uh, you know, channel manipulation or a bunch of uh, things that would improve the model performance. But then, does the model, uh, does the pre-processing happen on the device, or does it happen like? Uh, so the. The only thing that happens on the device is um, the, the, I would say the conversion, the model conversion from vanilla MXNet form 
to uh, Intel optimized form, and then of course prediction. Okay, but the model that we deploy there, it's it's just a normal model. It's a uh, it's a model that you we train in, you know, and our customers train on SageMaker. You could train it elsewhere if you wanted, um, and and of course it, it has nothing specific. Okay, so you can take uh, you can take your uh, your vanilla CNN, your uh, vanilla image data set, train it, uh, test it in the cloud, and then deploy it to deep lens. So. I would say all the, all the traditional steps that you could take during training to make the model more efficient, I, I don't know, data augmentation and, and those different things, uh, they, they will still apply, of course. Okay? But this, this really happens during training, and well, before training, actually, before data pr processing, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Pre I was yeah, you could do. For, so here, I guess, yeah, we do an extra step, which is resizing. So if you wanted to resize, if you wanted to do, you know, white balance or any kind of normalization, yeah, you could do that in the lambda function too, right? But keep in mind, you know, this is an Intel atom, right? So don't go wild on uh, on pre-processing, otherwise your performance drops. Okay. But uh, yeah, totally uh, resizing. Uh, normalization, you could absolutely, absolutely do that. Sure. Thanks. Hi. Yep. Um, I have a question that is more related to uh, MXNet. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the importance to be like optimized for specific hardware um, and Intel. I'm not using mostly hardware Intel to train deep learning mm -hmm. algorithm, but more like um, NVIDIA hardware. And I was just wondering um, the order of the tensor. Uh, in MXNet, is it like NWHC or NCWH? Because it um, has some, it explains some import, uh, some difference between like PyTorch and TensorFlow, making PyTorch more efficient on NVIDIA yeah. hardware for that. So I'm wondering for you, uh, MXNet. Yeah, you control that during training. I mean, uh, if you want to put your, uh, if you want to put, uh, you know, channels, number of channels before height and width. Yeah, but if I have to do a lot of uh, transposition, it slow down. Yeah, I, I would say what I usually see is, you know, batch size, um, uh, number of channels, height and width. That's, that's what people tend to use most. But, yeah, uh, but if you want to try something else, fine. I would say here, you know, anyway, we're predicting image by image, so it's, you know, it's, uh, it's batch size is one all the time. Uh, I, I didn't try predicting more than that. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bit, a bit afraid of the performance. It, it, it would work, but it's, I guess it would just be choppy, right? And uh, we're trying to get to the highest uh, FPS uh, possible. So probably predicting one at a time is the best thing. All right, I think we have to move on. Yep. Um, about this, so it's not available for purchase yet. Not yet, yeah. mid-June. All right, uh, we are... <laughs> We have a, a, an echo device, that'd be better, but we're giving away an echo device to the person who uh, has the most retweeted tweets about the piece, including that hashtag. Maybe next year we'll do it with this. It's not too expensive. <laughs> yeah, we um, can, okay, so I, I get the message. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. and, and to make you happy next year, we'll uh, work on another fun t-shirt. I'm thinking of a Iron Maiden. Right, yeah, well, that, for London, that would <laughs> definitely work, yeah? All right, um, All right. so let's thank, thank you, Julian thank again. You again. Thank you again. Thank you. Next up is a couple of uh, startup pitches. That's part of the AI startup battle, so the battle itself is later today. But uh, there's two sets of pitches, so two startups pitching now. They've got five minutes each. Uh, two startups pitching after the tea break in the afternoon, and then we'll have the actual competition with our AI jury in at the end of the day, just before drinks. All right. So um, I'll let you guys uh, introduce yourself. We don't have that, that much time, but um, I have a stopwatch. Okay. Cool. So I'll keep it going. Okay. Hi. So my name is Jim Dowling. I'm the CEO of Logical Clocks. And we're based in Stockholm. We're from the University of KDH in Stockholm in Sweden. And I'm going to tell you about our product called HOPS, which is the re result of many years of research and development. So what we're trying to attack the problem here is that you have a few hyperscale AI companies that have access to large clusters of GPU compute and the tools with which to exploit that compute. 
and basically their data scientists are much more productive. So the best results, the best prediction models are trained at a few companies that most of you know about. There is no equivalent solution for enterprises out there right now, and we have built one. It's called Hops. Uh, the, it's basically a data platform with support for many GPUs and TensorFlow. And what we'll enable you to do is, it'll enable you to climb the hierarchy of needs. So it's not enough to be able to just do AI. You need to have a data platform. You need to be able to build data pipelines to bring your data in. You need to do machine learning. And to get to the top of the pyramid, you need to really do distributed deep learning. So the platform we're building on is called Hops. Hops itself is an award-winning platform. These are not vendor numbers. These are peer-reviewed numbers. Uh, we got 16 times the throughput of Hadoop on our platform. Uh, we won the IEEE Scale platform for it last year. It's basically a new distribution of Hadoop with distributed metadata. So what the platform will offer you is a unified platform for doing data engineering and data science. So it'll improve the productivity of your data scientists and engineers and uh, IT people. We're selling it on-premise primarily. It will work on cloud, but that's the market we're going for right now. Um, we support a platform licensing model and enterprise version of our open source platform. And uh, we're also looking with a support revenue model. If you're interested in how it can help you, we have some ROI calculators for improving the productivity of our data scientists. And we also have one I'll show you for GPU platform that we're selling as well. It's a very large market, as you will all know. Data analytics is like $18 billion this year. Um, and the, the other platform that we're selling is we're sell we will put and install GPU servers for you on-prem. Uh, primarily, people will be looking at DGX1s, but there's an alternative a, called Deep Learning 11 server. It'll give you 75% of the performance of a DGX1 for a sixth of the price. So that's very interesting. We have some companies interested in this. It's based on the 1080 Ti uh, NVIDIA GPUs that many of you will have heard about. And we can get them to scale quite well for training and for experiments. So how will we improve the productivity of your data scientists? Well, if you're doing uh, uh, experimentation, so you're in, in the process of doing hyperparameter optimization, it can be very slow. You're doing things serially, you only have maybe a few GPUs on your desktop, but we can do it all in parallel. So you treat your GPU resources as one device. It's nice to developers, so we have our own API. So if you want to add new hyperparameter experiments, you just add to the dict here, add some new values, and it'll run them all in parallel and you don't have to wait. And it will aggregate the results in TensorBoard so you can see the results nicely in if you're doing TensorFlow or Keras. If you're doing distributed training, it may take days or weeks if you have large volumes of data. Again, if you, uh, if you run it on a, a large cluster, you can get that down to hours or minutes. So the more GPUs you have, depending on what you're training, you can generally get the time down way. OK, so what, what is unique about our platform is we have an, a, a unique data governance model based around the notion of what we call projects. So if you have a, a platform with some users on it and you have some data sets, a project will just be a line you draw around users and data sets. And within that particular project, everything will be secure, fully isolated. So you can have sensitive data within a data set and uh, it's okay to, to have it there. So you can give a user access to your data and they won't be able to export the data out, cross-link it with other projects. You can have company-wide data sets and projects. It's a very flexible model. I'll give you a quick example of how to set up a team with data sets. Imagine you have some FX currency information coming into a Kafka topic, and you want to give access to, to a team. You can split that data out into historical and real-time data, and then give the team. The team will now manage their own project. Who has access to the data? This is fully GDPR compliant. You have data owner who's responsible for it. You don't need IT to be involved to manage your, your projects anymore. And the reason we can do that is because we're the only enterprise Hadoop platform with TLS security model. OK, so I have an actual demo, and I think I have another minute or 30 seconds. You, you can go downstairs and look at this later on, but this is what it looks like in the UI. Um, I have a demo. You can manage your data sets, search for them here. We have some tours with which you can get started. Creating projects is a very quick, easy thing to do. Uh, when you go into a project, then you can actually then run Spark jobs, TensorFlow jobs. Uh, we support Flink as well. Um, you can manage the membership of your project. You can easily add people, change their role from data owner to data scientist. Data scientists are very limited. They can only run programs and not upload to download data. You can install Python libraries on all the nodes in your cluster. We have Anaconda environments for every single, uh, on every single machine for your project. And this is a really nice feature. It's quite unique. Um, so I'll just I'll skip over this demo. You can go downstairs and look at it a bit more. I think it finishes off with a distributed uh, hyperparameter optimization for uh, TensorFlow, which is quite nice. 
um, but we'll just skip over that. So that's skipping uh, the data set sharing aspect of it. So the platform has been around a while, a little bit. We have, we have our own managed version of it running on hops.site. We've had 450 users in Sweden. We have a number of companies using this, uh, so we have a pipeline. Uh, not many of them paying as of yet. Some of them are paying, but not directly to us. And uh, we have a team behind it. So we've got a large team of 12 people, uh, and that's us, Logical Clocks. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, while Ben gets set up, maybe we have time for one question, but not more than one question. All right. No. Oh, there was one. Sorry. Oh, you. When do we start? So we started development of the distributed file system in 2011. But we have only had the platform out since last year. Uh, if you have any more questions, I guess you'd be downstairs, right? Yeah, I'm around. So, uh, the startups competing in the battle will be downstairs. Uh, so yeah, use the tea break to um, have a look at the demos. And I'll leave the floor to Ben. Thanks. Is this working? Uh, so a little bit of a different uh, company here. This company is not targeted at data scientists per se. It's targeted at uh, pharmaceutical companies. So Andiverse, antibody drug discovery in one day. An antibody uh, is one of these one of these Y-shaped molecules, they're proteins made by the body. They're used to bind to and neutralize threatening molecules, whether that's on a bacteria, cancer cell, toxin, or virus. They're also used for medicines, very widely used for cancer and autoimmune disease. They, the advantage of them is they bind very specifically to their target, and they can be designed to target any molecule you want. Compared to traditional small molecule drugs, they have four times higher success rate in approvals, seven times higher growth rate, five of the top worldwide best-selling drugs and antibodies, and the world number one by a wide margin, and a record holder with $18 billion in sales last year. So, it's a good target. How do they get discovered? Uh, you select your target molecule that you want to target, that's down to the biologists, and requires a deep understanding of the disease in question. Step number two is to generate a number of molecules that will bind to that target, and then steps three and four are selecting a good one and making it better. What Antiverse does is hit generation, finding molecules out of the essentially infinite number of molecules you could, finding a number that bind to that target and have other desirable properties. The way that's done at the moment, <coughs> there are two methods. Immunization, where you take your molecule and you inject it into an animal, whether that's a chicken, a rabbit, a mouse, a rat, and harvest antibodies that they make naturally. The other option is lab display where you have a library of a few billion molecules and you screen them against your target and you find a few that bind. They're both pretty crude, they've both been around for decades. They both have a number of problems. So it takes a long time, quite a lot of expertise in lab space. Quality, variable, repeatability and scalability just aren't there. It's a serial process, you can't, you can't do more than one at once unless you have two labs. Uh, you need a high quality sample. You actually need to be able to make that target molecule. And actually a lot of the really interesting drug targets nowadays are membrane proteins and a lot of them just can't be made uh, in the form that you need for these processes. So drug companies are screaming out for a better solution, which is computational hit generation, which is what we do. The problem with that is uh, <coughs> there is not very much data around. Uh, a lot of it was not made. Uh, in the current processes and people didn't need to make it for decades, so it's not there. Uh, what there is is probably proprietary. Academics can't afford to make it because these projects are expensive. The relationship, as I mentioned, is incredibly complex. There are a Google or more possible antibodies and you know, binding. People use supercomputers to uh, do this when they've got high quality 3D structures with antibodies and a lot of targets. Those also don't exist. So how do we do this? We don't need the 3D structures, we work on sequences. So proteins are made of sequences of am amino acids and they fold into their final shape. We do wet lab data generation using in-house high throughput methods and we use machine learning models that are particularly tuned to this domain in the same way that convolutional nets are great for images and recurrent nets are good for text, crudely speaking. The, the uh, commercial uh, model is Pharmaceutical companies provide us with sequence of a target molecule. We provide them with sequence of antibodies that bind to that molecule. 
The great thing is it fits straight into their current methods. They do all the same testing as they would for any other method. We don't take any on any regulatory burden. The customers get results in hours, not months. Uh, we can scale. We can do as many as they like. And we think that will actually probably change the dynamics of how they go about uh, drug discovery at the moment. Rather than committing 18 months to a, a probable good target, they can afford to screen a load at once. Better results and uh, new targets as well. Who else is doing it? There are a couple of other companies doing this. Um, Biologic Design and Mab Silico. They're kind of one or two-man bands, academic spin-outs. Um, compared with small molecule drug discovery, which is uh, using AI. All these companies, AI for small molecule drug discovery. That's a pretty crowded space. Uh, the market is keen. We've got traction. Uh, we're in interesting discussions with a lot of people. I can't disclose our biopharma collaborators, um, but the market is big as well as keen. Top three customers that we're talking to at the moment have $100 million in sales just for these projects per year. Uh, total market is $4 billion, a lot of which is in pharma companies. Uh, we have a nice sales forecast. Big numbers going up steeply. It's all good. Um, product roadmap is to release. <laughs> yeah, it's not interesting. Um, product roadmap is to get to approval and revenue next year. Uh, I'm Ben. My colleagues, Rowena and Marat, aren't here today. Uh, we have an advisor from... Andrew Martin from UCL, actually. So, Andy Bess. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, again, we're late. I think we'll move everything 10 minutes back. Like, we'll start again at 10 past and then have lunch break at 10 past. And uh, yeah, I guess everyone wants to get tea or coffee, so go ahead. And if you want to talk to Ben, I guess he's around. Yep, I'll be downstairs. See you in a bit.
Okay, everyone, welcome to our first stream of the day. Um, we have two very interesting talks at the moment in the tools and deployments area. Uh, my name is Niall Roach. I'm the CTO in residence at the School of Management um, for UCL, just based downstairs. So please do come down and check out the expo down there. We've got quite a lot of sponsors and startup companies who are showing uh, some of the interesting projects that they're working on at the moment. Um, and so don't forget that there is that other session uh, downstairs. So we're going to start with our first speaker, and that's um, Dr. Beth Logan from DataZoo. Yep. And go to, she's going to be covering a very interesting and relevant area, which is developing al algorithms at scale and deploying them uh, into production while not having your tires fall off, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I'll leave, uh, yeah, I'll leave Beth to take it away. OK, can everyone hear me? Yes, awesome. So hi, I'm Beth Logan. I work at DataZoo from Boston. Um, and we have a really large-scale, interesting platform that serves ads on behalf of our customers. And it runs at huge scale, serves lots of ads per second, spends lots of money per second. And the industry is changing so often that we have to keep changing our algorithms. Um, so what we try and do is do that without breaking anything. And really this talk came about after many years of figuring out a process of how to do this successfully. So the takeaways from this talk, um, and Spoiler, this will really be a talk about process, like how to deploy machine learning at scale without breaking anything. Um, you'll learn how to deploy out and, up and upgrade algorithms on a huge scale system, which spends lots of money every day, without wasting money or making mistakes. And you'll also learn a little bit about programmatic advertising if you don't know about it already. So DataZoo um, is a Boston-based company. Um, we build software that marketers can use to run programmatic ad, ca ad campaigns. Um, our DNA is really about automated decision making. Um, everything in our platform runs automatically. The machine learning runs by itself. It deploys by itself. The models are checked you know, without us getting involved. They just deploy every day. Go for it. Um, and so our core product evaluates millions of op ad opportunities per second and then decides what to bid on those ad opportunities. So it's, it's just running 24 by 7 in lots of different countries around the world. So for those who don't know about programmatic advertising, um, this is an industry that really got going about 10 years ago, and that's actually when DataZoo started. Um, the, what really happens is people are moved from TV and print media to digital media. So all those uh, websites and apps and connected TV shows are actually, uh, well, what pays for them really is advertising. So when people view these websites or go to apps, there are places where ads can go and beforehand, the app developers or the website owners or the CTV people have connected with ad exchanges. And then behind the scenes, people like DataZoo, who, who run advertising on behalf of customers, have made deals with these ad exchanges. So every time someone goes to a website, for example, there's an opportunity to place an ad on that page. So DataZoo and other companies can bid on those ad opportunities. If we win the bid, we get to place the ad, we pay the money, and then we can track whether or not the user reacted to the ad. So suddenly we have a whole data set for machine learning. Every time we, log, we serve an ad, we log, log that opportunity, and then we can connect later in the system that that user actually reacted to the ad. So in theory, this is actually good for everyone. It's good for the advertisers because they don't waste money placing ads where people don't want, care about them. And it's good for users because they're going to see things that are more relevant to them. So the machine learning in this process injects in the place where we're doing the real-time bidding. And we're just going to learn from consumer reactions to ads. So as I keep alluding to, our world is, is kind of complicated. We're processing a lot of data every day. We obviously do this in the cloud. Um, we're making a lot of decisions per second. The system can't stop. We're running, learning thousands of machine learning models every day. Each of our customers has different ad campaigns. And each of the different ad campaigns has multiple machine learning models, depending on the different KPIs that the advertiser has chosen. So, there's a lot going on, and it's all going on in an unattended way, automatically. So as I keep also alluding to, bidding can't stop. We cannot stop. We cannot stop spending if there's an experiment. We'll be in a lot of trouble if, uh, if that happens. And we have a pretty small team. It's a small company. It's 300-ish people. Probably have 15 data scientists in the company. And the people working on the production data science is only really four people. Uh, and then there's four software engineers that we work with. So. We learned long ago that it's probably not effective for the data scientists to write production code. We actually let the engineers do that and let the data scientists focus on the data science. But still, we have to work together, so we have a really, really tight-knit team 
Um, we don't sit together actually because the engineers are in a, a different country, <laughs> um, but we're on a Slack channel and um, we have daily meetings and we have weekly meetings where we discuss all the machine learning experiments that we're doing. And the data, the data engineers actually, some of them have masters in machine learning, so they're pretty familiar with everything. So programmatic advertising has been around for about 10 years, maybe a little bit longer. And I've worked at the same company for nine years, and that's because it's pretty interesting. There's lots of new things always coming up, um, and you think you're done, and then, no, a whole new thing starts up. Um, we make changes to the system, and then maybe, it, it used to be that something would last for a couple of years, now it's maybe 18 months or, or less, so just because things are changing so much. So I sort of went, looked back at our records, and I think a new feature exits our team, depending what you count as a feature, every one to two months. So. We, have, we kept pretty busy um, upgrading the system such that we can uh, support these new features. If we don't support the new features, um, we'll lose our competitiveness and we'll lose customers. So we have to do it. But we obviously can't break production, so how do we do this? Um, so first let me just step back and explain how we actually bring ideas to production. So this is our research pipeline, pretty similar to a drug discovery pipeline. So it starts with an idea. Uh, actually, this is a real, this is a real uh, report that I've sent. This is real projects that we had running probably six months ago. Um, we start with an idea, um, and then we run analytic tests on data just to see if the idea even has legs. And then if that, that seems reasonable, then we want to start doing small-scale tests in production. So we'll run, with some, well, I'll explain how, but we'll get the code into production, and then we run small tests, probably just on a few ad campaigns. And if that seems to work, we get some success, then we really start to ramp up the test. You really can't know if something works unless you try it at scale. So we do that, that's successful, then we'll actually get to the point where we can really figure out all the edge cases and write the product requirements, then it will go into production. So that's our research process, pretty straightforward. Now how does that really work in practice? So this is really the crux of the whole talk, so if you don't remember anything else, just remember this slide. So we actually have divided roles for how people um, work in our, in our company. Um, the data scientists, I said, don't write production code. So at the end of level one, when the decision is made to run live tests, we think that the algorithm's gonna work. The, the data scientists will specify either configs, actually right now it's configs, but we really wish it was an API. Um, one day we'll have an API. Um, and what we wanna do is enable that algorithm of production for certain advertising campaigns or even flights. A flight is a sort of sub-budget of an advertising campaign. We actually use flights a lot and our customers do too to sort of divide the campaign into different tactics. So once we've specified how to get that into production, the software engineers, we write a spec and then software engineers put, put the configs in into production. So now we have a tool that we can enable the algorithm selectively for different flights or campaigns. Depends, sometimes it depends on what the algorithm is, it makes sense. So on the right hand side here, you can see some examples of actually real configs um, that we've, we've specified that will enable certain algorithms to take place in production. And usually it's not just enabling it, it's also parameters you have to set. So once we enable that with certain parameters, we can really start to test the algorithms. So once we've got it in production, we can actually run a live test. We'll start with very uh, low risk tests at first. Uh, we have both internal and external ad campaigns in our system. Um, the internal ones are run in-house, and these ones direct to brand kind of campaigns. And these are actually sort of less risky because we can go and talk to the campaign managers. Um, and we also pick ad campaigns that are not going to finish tomorrow, that will keep going for a while. So that, again, if something goes wrong, we can really recover. Uh, we, it, if it's a really risky <coughs> test, we'll run it on what's called dog food budget. We run just our own budget. Um, and sometimes those tests are really just to make sure it really doesn't break anything. And we've been doing this for a while now. We, we haven't broken anything for years, touch wood. But you, know, just, you never know. Something could go wrong. Um, and a lot of money is at stake if we break the system, let's put it that way. So once we have it running on just a few ad campaigns, we'll then start really ramping up the tests. We run A-B tests. I'll say a bit more about the paradigm we use later. And then at some point, we really prove out the algorithm. At this point, the software engineers are really just monitoring the system doing their normal day jobs, they'll come to our meetings, they'll learn about the experiments, they know it's coming, they'll know if the experiments are successful, and that'll give them a sense of, oh, this is gonna be in production soon. So at this point, we've proven out the algorithm, 
We might enter what's called a SBO, which is standard business offering. We might offer the algorithm to customers, maybe for free, maybe not for free, and then they will, uh, that, that's actually a way to gauge interest in the algorithm sometimes, if it's a new feature. Um, sometimes the algorithm just is like a back-end algorithm, the customers are not involved. So then we'll just apply it manually every week or every, maybe twice a week, um, just to, to, actually at this point we're really just finding the, the really weird use cases that cause it to break. And this, this may go on for a short time or a long time, it depends on the priorities, depends on the value of the algorithm, and it depends also maybe on what the engineers are doing and whether they have time to put it in production. So at some point we decide to put it in production, we allocate time to the engineers, um, they, at that point, will assume ownership. The product requirements are written by the, soft, the uh, data scientists. Maybe PM, proje uh, project management, are involved, or marketing, if it's a feature that needs promotion. But otherwise, it just goes into production. Um, the engineers at this point may actually create metrics and alerts and unit tests and all the sorts of things that you need for a really professional uh, deployment so that it will run flawlessly and fit in with the rest of our system. So now I just want to give an example of how this actually works in practice. So we have, um, three years ago, um, most advertising we uh, placed was on what's called Open Exchange. So Open Exchange is where anyone, any website can connect and it's a true second price auction to um, figure out the, who's going to win the ad location. So this is all well and good, but then brands were a little un unhappy with, uh, there's a lot of fraud in advertising and other issues, and so brands actually wanted to have a bit more control, and so something emerged, which is actually an old idea, which is to have a private exchange. So the private exchange is still on the open exchange, but it's like a private deal. So certain websites, typically things like New York Times or something pretty nice, <laughs> um, would, would be involved, would be able to demand this. And what happens is there's a sort of, auction before the other auction, that if you're in the private auction, you, can, you have to bid a certain floor price to be in it, and you have to make a deal beforehand, but it, if you're in that auction, then um, you might get this private inventory. So when private inventory first came out, we were, a little, it, it, we were interested in it, and we started doing analysis, and we actually found out that actually the private inventory was actually had better performance, because it was actually better inventory. Like, it's much better to show an ad on a page or an app that's a genuine article and not fraud and, you know, a nice page and actually content people want to read. So we realized, oh gosh, our algorithms don't know anything about this. They're not bidding the floor price. We're not even bidding on this half the time. We really need to upgrade our algorithms. So in this case, this is how the research pipeline worked. At first we ran the analysis and we figured out, oh, we're not even spending on this private inventory very much. That's a problem. <laughs> um, and then we noticed, oh yes, it would actually be better to spend on this private inventory, it's actually got good performance. So we, after some analysis, we were able to write the spec of how the bidding should change so that we'd effectively use private inventory. And there's two major improvements. Obviously, we have to find the, the private inventory that's suitable for your ad campaign and would be campaign specific, in fact. Um, and then secondly, make sure we actually bid the floor price for that private inventory. And actually, uh, full disclosure, we, we've only really got the basic version of this working, but the private inventory auction is, is just as complex as the other auction and we need to actually probably upgrade that and make that a bit more sophisticated. But you know, the first working version really just makes sure we bid up above the floor. And depending how good the deal is, we'll bid higher above the floor, um, but that's pretty much how it goes right now. So then the software engineers made the changes. This is actually a change that had to change the way we bid, so a sort of high risk change, not just something around the edges, but something really in the core of the bidding. So then we ran a heap of live tests. Um, at first, again, we ran a smoke test with very low risk flights. Um, then we ran increasingly large live tests on sets of flights. So while we were doing that, actually we realized that we had uh, originally designed the algorithm for action-based campaigns. So an action-based campaign tracks whether a user does an action on a website or you know, maybe they buy a product. But also there are clicks campaigns, there are video completion campaigns, and some of these are more suited to uh, advertisers who care more about brands than actions. Um, so we realized, oh gosh, we should check those too. So we start up more live tests with those other type of KPIs. In fact, strangely, it didn't really work for video completion. And I think that is actually probably because video completion is not a really good metric. There's many times you <laughs> load a website and the video completes, and you didn't even watch it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really affect your, um, 
use of the product because the sound was off and all kinds of things. So um, we actually paused work on that and that happens sometimes. I mean, part of the point of a research pipeline is to eliminate things that are bad ideas. So that was good. Um, but you can see here there's typical results. Uh, I don't know if you can see it that well, but you can see that once we use the algorithm, the spend on private deals increased and the cost per action, in this case, decreased, which is a good thing. We want a lower cost per action. So again, in this stage, the software engineers were not heavily involved. They were just monitoring the system, letting us know if anything weird happened, uh, which it didn't. So that was all good. So finally, we got to the point where we decided the algorithm was working, at least for clicks and actions. We automated the generation of the configuration for across the board enabling this. We, we had a long discussion with product management about whether to make this a prop, an algorithm that we would sell, but we realized it was just, that actually in this case, it was good for us and good for our customers to have this algorithm enabled across the board, so there was no point selling it. Um, we created metrics and alerts, and we just applied this every week for a while, just to sort of make sure it was really working in production, uh, make sure there were no weird things we hadn't noticed, and then we had to also wait for the engineers to have time in their backlog to work on this. So at, finally, um, the engineers productized this, it was, and at this point, we, they just automated the generation of the configs, but in their own way, such that it was written in a proper engineering way with unit tests and all that. But um, you could argue that maybe we should have done it, you know, sometimes it's not right just to automate it and just use the same configs you were doing before. Um, sometimes it makes sense to really rewrite the algorithm from scratch and really embed it deeply in the machine learning, but in this case, it didn't really make sense. But there's been other cases where we have automated something and just completely, completely changed the way it was written and didn't use any of the data science code. And I think that's okay because when you're doing, like a long time ago when I started doing my PhD, um, I had been a software engineer before, and so I was trying to write really good code, and someone said to me, stop doing that, <laughs> because when you're doing research, you want to just get something minimally working. You don't need to make it perfect because you're going to be changing it a lot. And so it's true that the code that the data scientists had written for this was not, um, it's okay code, but it, it didn't really, it had some unit tests, but it wasn't really great code. But it was enough just to prove that the algorithm was viable. When the soft, software engineer, engineers took over, it became a much, much better piece of code and much more reliable. It's something we can, we don't have to wake up every night and worry if that thing is working. Because actually nearly every, um, nearly every flight in the system, except the video completion flights, um, are using this algorithm. So if anything went wrong, it would cause trouble. So now I just wanted to speak a little bit about A-B testing. So as we all know, it's good to do A-B testing to compare control and treatment for um, big experiments, or little experiments too. So with advertising, uh, we're running on live ad campaigns where people are changing things every, at least every day, sometimes more often. And that can actually mess up the test, right? So that's actually one reason to run a really big test so that the, the, the changes sort of average out across all advertisers. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is that seasonality can play a role. It's, it, you could hope that you could run a test one week without the algorithm, one week with the algorithm, of course, that's not going to work because all sorts of reasons could, could explain why people get more, there's more conversions one week to the previous week, just the nature of the ad campaign, all kinds of things could explain it. So that's a problem. Also, if you're going to run a, a test across many, many campaigns, you can't just put half the campaigns in the test and the other half not in the test because the actual KPI might be very different across advertisers. So if you're selling cars and your conversion is, um, configuring a car online, you're probably going to get a lot of those kind of conversions. But if you're actually selling a product that's like insurance or something where people have to sign up and fill in a form, give their social security number, you're not going to sell a lot of those things in comparison. So the, the, the cost per action for those two campaigns is very, very different. So you can't just lump all the campaigns together and use, use some average cost per action. That doesn't work. So after thinking about this for a while, um, our approach is, as I mentioned many times before, choose low-risk campaigns. Like, you don't want to run live tests on, uh, uh, like, a really important campaign that the customer is angry at you for some reason, or it's, like, a huge money campaign that, that's, like, a new campaign. You don't want to do that. You want to pick very low-risk campaigns that are running, probably running in-house, not finishing in the next four weeks or anything like that. 
um, and that would be a safe test. Next, you want to, this is the key thing actually, each campaign has different line items, so actually if you divide, the, uh, they're called flights, if you divide the campaign into two sets, then you can apply the algorithm to half of them and don't apply the algorithm to the other half. Now you can actually use the statistic of if you start the algorithm one week, you can look at the change in performance in each campaign between the flights in the treatment and the flights one week and the flights in the treatment in the next week, and then the change in performance between the flights in the control one week and the flights in the control the next week. If you look at that change and then you look at the change between the two, that will tell you whether the algorithm is working. And so even if users change things, maybe they just change a few flights here and there, maybe they change every flight in the campaign. Because you have many campaigns, all that balances out as well. So hopefully, this is an example of a, a nice result where this particular statistic, net revenue, um, didn't really change much in the control, but with this particular experiment, it was a lot better in the exposed. So this, this algorithm is a winner. Of course, there's, there's error bars and there's overlap, but this is a pretty strong result. Sometimes we see even stronger results depending on the algorithm. Um, this is the sort of result you want to see that gives you confidence that this algorithm is worth deploying and you know, spending engineering resources on to implement, which could take, you know, take a week, take a month. It's, it's resources you have to decide to allocate to this algorithm versus some other algorithm. So that's all I really wanted to tell you. Um, just if you have a large scale ML system, it depends who you are, but we have to take care with ours because it's spending money without us being involved. And so if it, if it does the wrong thing or if it, God forbid, stops spending money, that's also a bad thing for us. Um, but the paradigm we've developed, it does enable safe testing at huge scale. We work very closely with the software engineers and we have defined roles and everyone's really good at their role. So that's, that's a good thing. The data scientists focus on the testing, they focus on the statistics, they focus on the A-B testing, they focus on picking the campaigns. That we actually sometimes have to negotiate with different campaign managers whether it's okay to put their campaign in the test. The data, the engineers don't want to get involved in that, that's okay. And the engineers, they focus on keeping the system safe, protecting the business. But we collaborate very closely and I think that's a good way to, to, run, to run the system. So a final point, this may not apply to you, but in our domain, we, we had to sort of develop a really good paradigm for A-B testing, otherwise it just wouldn't have worked. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Right, round of applause for Beth. So I can run around with the mic. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, you're in the business of personalizing uh, advertisement, connecting the ad campaign to the right user. So with the upcoming uh, GDPR legislation, uh, meaning that if you're active in the EU market, you have to get consent for people to actually personalize ads. What do you do? Like, how do you? So we have lawyers who've been looking at this for a long time. <laughs> and currently, uh, with the current GDPR rules, we are still able to use machine learning. Uh, we, I mean, everyone has a right to be forgotten and all that's been taken care of. If someone is asked to be forgotten, they will be removed from our cache and we won't, we won't actually be able to, um, like if they saw an ad, we wouldn't actually be able to attribute the ad to them. So we'll probably have less, fewer conversions in the EU, I think. Um, but we, are, at this point, we are able to still do machine learning. I was a bit worried, like you, probably, you might be as well. Um, there is a new law coming out later in the year and I don't know if that will change things. But for now, I think we're good. And we're also going to be separating our EU data from our US, or US and Asian data as well, so that we're able to. Thank you very much. Yeah, we just we're totally yeah. in compliance with this law. We're totally I, on top of it. I would definitely <laughs> like to discuss a little bit more yeah. with you about that because, yeah, we do content recommendations, not advertisement, but other type of recommendations. Yep. So it's very similar. Anyway, thank you. Actually, we had a very good workshop yesterday around uh, GDPR and machine learning and how that can influence your models as well as not just the customer data, it's the bias that's built in. Um, but yeah, more questions? Yeah, would you say you rely more on upfront testing and static verification uh, or more on dynamic testing, verification, metrics, circuit breakers, etc.? You mean do we... I think I understand the question is, do we develop the algorithm more before we do the live testing or during the live testing? Yeah, to ensure that your program keeps on running in, in changing conditions. Um, 
it's a bit of both, really. I mean, sometimes we nail it in the, sometimes it's the algorithm is so, like this particular one, the algorithm was pretty obvious once you looked at the, the analysis. But sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't work the way you think in production. Like if we want to go back and do that video completion version of this algorithm, I think we'd have to rethink it and do something completely different. So it really depends on the algorithm. Any more questions? Oh, okay. Thanks. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, you hit on a really interesting point for me, which is the relationship between data scientists and software engineers. Um, how do you make data scientists care about uh, important things for software engineers and vice versa. How do you make software engineers care about important things for data scientists? Because I, I like the fact that you have strong, well-defined roles, but I sort of feel that it would maybe lead to, say, data scientists writing shitty code that then software engineers have to spend ages figuring out how to make it work, and also software engineers maybe building systems and not thinking about the metrics that the data scientists are focused on? Well, I think we're lucky that our software engineers are sort of wannabe data scientists, and they're, they're always running notebooks and things, and they actually will run analysis when they, when they deploy something. They'll do what we just did. They'll run a notebook on the, the system and show that it's really working the way it was supposed to work. So that, I think that angle is pretty covered, and they come to our, we have weekly, it's called a data science meeting, and uh, they come, and actually some other people in the company come to that meeting as well. So everyone is really excited about data science, so I think that's easy. How do you stop data scientists running, writing bad code is a bit harder. <laughs> um, so some of us used to write production code, and we got cured of, our bad, of some of our bad habits anyway. Um, but some of the newer people haven't, didn't, who weren't with the company as long didn't do that. But some of them still wrote really good code. I, I don't know. I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> you, have, you have a way to fix it? <laughs> it's actually the question that I wanted to ask initially. Is, uh, when you have this kind of situation where the data engineers rewrite most of it, I think it might be interesting to set up a process to have a feedback, like uh, some kind of presentation of what they did change and why, and, uh, yeah, and that's to good idea. up the software engineering skills of the data scientist team so that it can be more efficient from the start and the next time. We definitely usually have an architecture review um, before we actually de deploy it. I mean, sometimes the architecture review happens when we wrote those ori original configs because already at that point we're changing production and it might be a problem. Um, yeah, but I think that's another good idea. Oh, to have code reviews, feedback. like also yeah, code exactly. reviews is a very good we, tool. Yeah, we do have code reviews. So the shepherding into production involves the data scientists looking at the code reviews, but also the other. For them, sometimes it's hard because what will happen is the engineers will make it really object-oriented code, which the data scientists tend to write very functional code, just because they're just thinking about how the algorithm works. So sometimes for them, it is actually hard <laughs> to read the engineers' code. So that's why the engineers prepare all these um, notebooks and things to show that the code really does the right thing. They usually do very serious validation tests. Oh, t just time for one quick one. Yep. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Lee Baker from Selden. Um, just one question. Do you think your particular business challenge stands up to kind of perhaps more advanced A-B testing, multivariate testing, usage of uh, multi-arm bandits to put traffic into different models in a, in a production environment? Yeah, we may not have enough flights for that. But actually, we do have tens of thousands of flights in the system, so yeah, we might be able to do that. I think you would have to change the settings more frequently though, right? So we'd have to, we probably would actually need an API to do that. Like right now, the way we put configs in production is doing a release. It's fairly automated, but it's not like an API that it, you can, anyone can do at any time. So it's a bit more, it's not a bit more heavyweight, I guess. But yes, but we could improve our A-B testing, especially if we had more than four people. <laughs> okay, can we get a round of applause for Beth, Thank please? Thank you. Okay, so staying with the ad tech theme, um, we're moving in probably more GDPR questions I would, uh, I would see in the future around this. Um, but we have an interesting talk around scaling pipelines for um, ad tech. So, sorry, just give us a moment to get set up. Yeah, you're 
good to go. Yeah. Okay, so we have Musa Tafi from AppNexus, and the uh, stage is yours. Yeah. Uh, welcome everybody, thank you for staying. I'm like the last person between you and lunch, I understand. Uh, thank you for sticking with me. Uh, previous presenter did a great job at explaining uh, the company where I work, so I'll, I'll thank her for that. Uh, AppNex is, my presentation is called uh, Scalable Machine Learning Pipelines for Click Predictions. It's joint work with uh, uh, the data scientist Tian Yu and uh, Jena Volkovich. I'm a more of a, a data science platform engineer, so I'm like in the, in the intersection of the two. Today what I wanted to cover is basically we have four themes for you to take home if you wanted to build something like this or you wanted to apply it to a uh, similar kind of uh, uh, environment. And we have one case study that's our production uh, click prediction pipeline. So the four themes that I, I want you to remember at the end of this talk are basically these four pillars that we, we try to um, agree on as a team. So we have uh, research production parity. We have preventing uh, pipeline jungles. We need uh, experiment versioning for model exploration and fast iteration. And we need to understand clearly what are the trade-offs of model freshness. Uh, the case study that I will be uh, presenting uh, is based on uh, the AppNexus platform, which is an internet technology company that powers uh, real-time sale and purchase of digital advertising, uh, so real-time bidding. Our scale is worldwide, five continents, uh, which basically encompasses something like 400 billion uh, impressions seen per, per day, and we transact on that around uh, 10 billion transactions per day as peak. Um, so it's it's a little it's you know it's it's like it's like bigger than 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 most, but uh, but it's uh, it's a very challenging uh, problem. And uh, and so the the numbers the description that I have for you today is is based on on our pipeline uh, from 2016 to mid 2017. It changed. Uh, you know, it's, it's constantly evolving. So we took a snapshot for you to, to report back to the community because the, the literature is very sparse on, on what are the best practices for uh, this kind of scale and this kind of use cases. So just to give you a brief overview again about uh, how real-time bidding works, when you go to a web page, uh, you have an ad call that goes like, hey, you know, I have this user on my website. It goes to an ad exchange. In this case, we have the AppNexus in bus. And uh, a bid request is sent to a bidder. And the bidder has to make a decision on how much should we bid on this impression. And to do that, uh, it asks for a prediction request. Uh, and it gets a prediction uh, response, which has a certain level of uh, uh, probability and, and like how much should we bid on this impression. That's, that's fed back to the in-bus, which uh, uh, runs a second price auction and then determines if, um, if, the, if the bid should win or not. And then depending on who won the, the auction, then uh, the adequate uh, creative is showed to the user on the web page or the app or uh, whichever medium you use for the publisher. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's like <laughs> 20,000 uh, feet uh, sort of view of the world. But uh, if you just want to think about it from our perspective, it's you have some data that you need to train on. You generate a bunch of models. And then you're able to upload these uh, models to an API. And uh, you execute, uh, by the end of this talk, uh, like <laughs> hundreds, hundreds if not thousands of <laughs> millions of uh, uh, like auctions will have been running already. And so uh, the opportunity uh, is, is pretty high. We've seen, uh, like, a, like the presenter before me said, like a high, very uh, high interest in digital media, like moving away from TV. And, uh, and so the IAB, which is like an organism that tries to... Uh, wrangle all these uh, media companies, uh, estimate uh, uh, 80 f $85 billion uh, dollars for uh, 2017. And uh, 
So to be competitive in this industry, advertisers rely on accurate ad click-through rate prediction. We need to understand uh, how, how to spend their budget effectively and hit their KPIs. So for, from our perspective, we, we need to be able to uh, evaluate the machine learning models efficiently to avoid any timeouts and to optimize for uh, memory efficiency. So the challenge, uh, the challenge is exactly what we discussed before, is that you have these two forces. At one end, you, have the, you want really low uh, interest rates of technical debt. Uh, I remember a talk here that happened from a Scully about the high interest rates of machine learning. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was really, somebody talks to your problem and you really like it. It's actually a very nice uh, presentation. I, I welcome you to, to check it out. But on the other hand, you have the how much uh, flexibility should we give to the data scientists so that they don't uh, you know, you know, try out the next uh, big thing uh, without, um, without control. So it's like a little bit of a nice trade-off there that needs to be uh, handled. So from our perspective, what does make, what, like end-to-end, -end, the word end-to-end -end, uh, ML pipelines is so special. We're not talking Kaggle. We're not talking, <laughs> we're not talking uh, uh, any sort of uh, data-driven uh, competition or ML-driven competition. We're talking production, real money, uh, real transactions. Uh, you know, whole businesses can fail because of, of uh, overspend or underspend or, or uh, those kind of problems. So, so the first lesson that we learned is this idea of research production parity. So the interaction. Uh, just to give you an idea, the interaction between data science and engineering, or optimization like we call it, is uh, rely on, not only on the classical kind of software engineering things such as packages, but it also relies on data dependencies and uh, data semantics. And so we, and, uh, we need to, to give to the data scientists and to the engineers the right runtimes for their, for their, uh, for their models. We need to take care of the package dependencies, the versions when they evolve, uh, any sort of uh, machine learning package that we use. You know, if, uh, if a specific threshold changed from version 19 to 21, uh, that could affect business. So we need to be very careful about that. And then the model serving infrastructure is something that never gets taught. I mean, that maybe starts to be taught now, but model serving infrastructure, how do you present these models to, to, the, to the consumers? To, like to, to serve your model is, is, is pretty new, I would say. It's not, uh, it's not as explored as it should be. The second lesson that I want to talk is this uh, pipeline jungles. Pipeline jungles basically happen when you have teams that are not integrated, uh, basically data science engineering, where they use different tools. You have all this glue code that happens just to be able to transform, train data into ML models. And... Uh, Mainly, uh, mainly it's for transforming data into piping it in and to, to the model during serving or during training or in testing validation. And so we came up with this evolution kind of so that you know where you are on this, on this evolutionary scale where you have at the beginning, you know, when it all started basically individual custom scripts that people build and then, and then you move into a shared data pre-processing uh, jobs so that we actually know what happened to the data before it was fed in the ML pipeline. Then you have a unified data store where we know which features are in there and we can reproduce uh, experiments, we can reproduce behavior in production. And then we have a unified ML features store uh, for the models as well and for the metrics that we are, we're tracking so that you have a unified place where you have all this these elements for you to look at as a data scientist or engineer so that you can debug problems at 4 a.m. in the morning and you don't have to like, uh, you know, start guessing what's happening. The, the third lesson that I want to share with you is the experiment versioning. So experiment versioning uh, is, is central to a data scientist's life where uh, a certain metric is not behaving as expected and we need to improve it. Uh, we want to explore this new product and uh, I invite you all to think about what an experiment encompasses. Where are these boundaries of this, of this uh, experiment? So uh, from our perspective, it, uh, we consider source code. 
is part of the experiment. So experiment metadata, any sort of config that, that needs to be handled needs to be part of the experiment. Data dependencies, package dependencies, and runtime. And then what have you. You can add anything. But really, deciding with your team about what's the boundaries of an experiment is crucial for your success. Um, also, what happens is that in a business setting, you want to, you know, I mean, I, I come from an academic setting where I was doing my PhD in computer science, and I was taught that reproducibility is very important. However, uh, in a business setting, you need to understand how, what's the cost of doing reproducible science, and, and how far back should we, do, uh, should, we, should we be able to reproduce. Also, uh, you want to avoid any sort of time travel issues. So that comes for free when you have a unified, uh, unified uh, ML store where uh, you don't want a situation where the data scientist has access to feature data that happens at uh, serving time but not at training time. So some, like, some data that should not be available at training time is magically ha uh, available at training time. So defining exactly the, the, the data dependencies that you need are, uh, is, is very important for you to, to be able to scale this up. The, the fourth one is the model freshness trade-offs. So something that we don't think about is this interaction between these four components. You have, for on one hand, you have the model update frequency, how, how frequent should we upload our model? Uh, and then, on the, uh, then you have what system do you use for uh, job scheduling of these models? And it, it interacts with the predictive performance. How much, uh, how much uh, log loss did we lose? And then uh, how much it, it costs to train a specific training, specific model family, for example. And so, uh, so in, in, especially in RTB, the, 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 the data sources are not fixed. The data sources are constantly streaming, constantly fluctuating, depending on seasonality. And, uh, and so we need to be able to react to it very in a fine-tuned manner. So what we came up with is uh, to determine specific job scheduling uh, options and evolution, where you start with you know, your... Uh, the, the thing we all love to use is cron, uh, where you play and pray. But then you have, uh, <laughs> you, have better, you have better options that you should be exploring. You have things like you have at least something that retries on failures when model training fails. And how many times should it, should it retry? Uh, then you can have a job scheduling mechanism that uh, uses the predictive performance of the model so that you can determine how frequently should we, should we build the models. And then on top of that, if you use both the predictive performance and the technical cost of training, you can get even better, uh, you, you can have higher utilization of your systems with, and lower the costs of producing these models. So the case study that I have for you today uh, is the, is the ML pipeline that we built uh, like uh, 2017, was, uh, is, is just about click prediction in an RTB setting. So the challenge of this pipeline, uh, it's not a single CSV from uh, the UCI uh, thing. It's 400 billion uh, impressions since per day, uh, 10 billion transactions uh, at, per day at peak. We, want to, we wanted to focus on how cost effective we can be. And uh, we wanted to enable the team to iterate very quickly on their models without being too locked up into uh, specific uh, frameworks. And then, as I said, we have dynamic data streams. Uh, and uh, the key also for specifically for this use case is the tight, really tight model serving constraints. Um, similar to, to edge, edge uh, devices, where you have very tight uh, timeouts and, and tight resources that you can only that you can use, um, and so we target below 100 millisecond uh, prediction time for a single impression, and uh, so that introduces a bunch of challenges. Um, so so we have uh, we have a paper in the in uh, like scheduled for PMLR where we ha where we dig in even deeper, but uh, we have uh, like. 
like a d deep dive in this architecture where we have data gathering, uh, model training and selection, uh, model serving, and uh, model monitoring. Uh, I invite you to visit, to, to, to check out our paper. But uh, I, I wanted to share with you this spectrum here where sometimes uh, n n new users of machine learning pipelines, when they join a, like a real company that's uh, like doing actual, uh, you know, model training, you, you have this spectrum that you need to pick from. And uh, on one hand, you have the full kind of just-in-time feature transformation where you allow the researchers to experiment with new features uh, by scanning all of the logs every time they want to do anything. And on the other end of the spectrum is when you have a, a somewhat solidified uh, schema of what are the features that are, that are available in the data warehouse. In our case, we went more with the ML feature data warehouse, uh, and uh, this we allow the users to have custom lookbacks, uh, and uh, we we can amortize the the, the training the, the data pro pre-processing job for the training data with this data warehouse. It also reduces pipeline jungles, as you can imagine. Um, for model training hyperparameter, like I said. Uh, we want to we we use like a Spark ML library for 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 that. Uh, its scalability matches our, our scale. And, but what's uh, more important for us is our tools that give us sparse models. So, for example, logistic regression with its very good uh, L1 uh, regularization aspect uh, gives us very sparse models that are uh, fast to evaluate uh, at prediction time. Also, some, some libraries have both uh, like Python and Scala Java uh, libraries, and so it helps with this idea of uh, research prod parity. For hyperparameter search, uh, it can get very expensive, as we all know, and uh, we use a, like a certain uh, uh, pre, like we, are, we, to const we, need a way, we needed a way to constrain the, the, the search space of the hyperparameters. And so we run offline experiments to pre-constrain the, the, the experiments. Uh, for model serving, like I said, we have bid responses that are very tight, lower than 100 milliseconds. And, uh, and so here I show the process to actually add a new feature to the serving layer. So uh, it's something that's not covered very well in, in literature. What, what should you take into account? when you are adding a new feature to, the, to your serving layer. Uh, especially when it's managed by a different team because that, the team has uh, specific uh, goals in terms of, of scale. And so you start with selecting a new feature and then you, you evaluate its predictive performance first through a data scientist's work. And then you, uh, you can propose this feature to the model serving team, the bidder team. And then you can evaluate the runtime in, a, in a, a subset of the bidders. And then you can include or reject features. So to do give a couple examples, for example, adding a uh, single integer ID as a feature, uh, that's feasible. Uh, adding full text of the add context, you start seeing a little bit of, of pushback. And uh, things like adding the full video of the ad context with like, uh, you know, you want to, to push uh, uh, <laughs> like a bunch of frames to be uh, and still have that kind of 100 millisecond timeout uh, is, is pretty hard. And so, so the, f the, f the last piece is, is how uh, we discovered that not everybody cares about uh, every all the metrics that are in the in our pipeline. So, so we divided uh, we divided the the metrics into two channels so that it's less confusing for everybody. We have channel for business metrics, which uh, product managers care about, and uh, senior leadership cares about, and those are like click through rate, delivery rate, spend. Uh, but then, but then what's new is that you need to. Uh, build a whole set of dashboards and, and alerting systems that just target just the data scientists and the product, produ production owners of the software pipelines. And so we, uh, for to, to look at stuff like prediction bias, uh, 
what's the log loss on all three types of uh, train test validation data sets, and what are the model parameter ranges. Because model parameter ranges uh, was a surprise for me that like you can actually use those to see the variability in your model across hour by hour uh, training, and then you can t tune the, the the frequency of the of the training. So you can reduce the training frequency and save cost. Uh, and at the same time, you end up with similar models. If the models don't change too much across time, then you can use that as a as a metric to tune your job scheduling. This is very interesting. So if you remember just four things from this presentation, I want you to, to, to get out with this, this, this too. You know, it was uh, uh, to stay with the software engineering for ML kind of uh, ideas. You have, uh, we strive towards research uh, production parity, means like same tools uh, should be used, or similar to very close collaboration needs to happen. Uh, and then you have preventing pipeline jungles. So if you can go toward the data warehouse where you have enough flexibility for data scientists, I think that's, that's, that's better. Um, but it depends on your data sets, obviously. Uh, experiment versioning. I, I invite you all to actually just, what is an experiment and what does it, where do you draw that, uh, that, that, uh, that box so that you can determine, you know, this experiment was responsible of this result and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, intellectual kind of uh, exercise. And uh, the fourth one is this model freshness trade-offs where you can tune your training cost uh, and data processing cost by uh, determining how fresh should the models be before you, um, you decide to update a model. So uh, this, like I said, we, are, we have like a fuller kind of description of our pipeline uh, to, to you know, contribute to the very sparse, like I said, literature about, about uh, production pipelines. Uh, but uh, my, my collaborators are here to, to you know, answer any question if you want to contact us. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Ladies first. <laughs> oh, it's not really a question, it's a comment. I think you must have, you undersold yourself a bit with the 100 milliseconds because it's actually network and other things going on in that 100 milliseconds. So I know in our system, we only have 10 milliseconds to respond. Right, right. So you're probably the same. Yeah, it's a sim very similar timeouts. Yeah, yeah. Very similar requirements for, to, because you go through a bunch of intermediaries and so you need to account for that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you discussed about the, the, the computational constraints for building features, uh, like, mm -hmm. um, uh, but for contextualized features, they, they could be shared for many impressions, so why not have some expensive feature that is computed once from on one uh, media web page and then reuse many times and have a pipeline to manage those uh, costly features? Like you could have, for instance, a, a rendering of uh, an image rendering of the web page and use a neural network that extract uh, an embedding of the visual aspect of the page and, uh, mm. and reuse that uh, embedding vector for many ad impressions and set up a pipeline to, to manage this. To, to use the, yeah, to, to use the content of the, to use even the content of the, of the, of the publisher, right? Yeah, the context, yeah. That's, that's, that's actually still a challenge, right? Because the, but even if you embed the, the image, um, uh, yeah, if you, if you generate an image like autoencoder or like some, some sort of uh, way to uh, generate uh, like a compressed representation of the image, uh, you still need to be able to uh, refresh it like every time there is a new content on the web page and you need to be able to, to deal with uh, just like a dynamic nature of what publishers put on their web pages. You cannot rely on, um, I mean, you can, if we're talking like color scheme, like <laughs> some people fine, but if you're talking about like actual text that's happening on the, on the web page, uh, it, gets, it gets tricky. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's still a moving field, right? We don't, we don't have like, the, what I was more like targeting was, was to reduce pre-processing time is really to take a look at your pre-processing whenever you have global, global statistics that you need to build. So if you're building, if you're normalizing, for example, over 
uh, over you know uh, hundreds of millions of impression of rows of your data sets then do you really need to do that you know that's uh, it, it it comes to a surprise for for data scientists for example that are not versed in uh, parallel computation into into understanding how a distributed median uh, is computed and so it, it, there's like a lot of back and forth in terms of like how much how much lift do we get from a feature transformation versus versus should we include it or not <laughs> like, yeah. yeah depending on how the algorithms that are available to us you know uh, they have limits and and yeah it's, thank you any other questions Hi, Alice Sowerby from DotMesh. Um, that was brilliant, really, really interesting. Um, the question that I have is relating to reproducibility. So you mentioned the cost of reproducibility. Um, what, what, in your opinion, are the factors that contribute to making it a costly thing to do? Yeah, well, cost, well the, I mean, the usual costs in terms of infrastructure costs, in terms of storage, in terms of... Uh, how, at which granularity do you need the data to be able to reproduce uh, your uh, experiments? So if you know if if your if your feature transformation is able to uh, compress the data uh, hundred times, then uh, yes, obviously you can store a longer look back of uh, of your data set so you can reproduce what happened last Black Friday versus this Black Friday. But if you want uh, impression by impression, like row by row kind of event by event uh, data sets, then, then, uh, then it gets tricky. Then you need to be able, to, some, it's, not, it's not impossible, you just need to filter by, by who are the most like, uh, riskiest kind of cases where we have to keep the, we have to keep the, the, the archived data sets pretty much. And then we need to train the data scientists into, uh, into what does it mean to be an archive form. Because uh, because uh, not everything is you know <laughs> I mean you have S3 fine but then you if you you have like uh, HDFS storage for example that's a hot available uh, great but then uh, to reduce cost we need to ship stuff to cold storage and to bring it back uh, for you to run an experiment on the past uh, year if it's non-aggregated data then uh, the cost increases that's what I meant by the how far back and how much it costs. Right, yeah. so it, it's mainly about the storage and the size of the data sets then? Yeah, like uh, yeah, converting, exactly. And, and like thinking in terms of how you can make your feature transformations, which feature you use impact how easy it is to reproduce. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? We're just about to break for lunch and maybe we might get out ahead of the other group, get a head start on them. A uh, big round of applause for both of the speakers. Thank you. Really interesting. So we're back after lunch, continuing on the kind of practical machine learning. I think the next one's on machine learning and open source. Um, and then we have a little case study afterwards. So lunch is downstairs, level 38, UCL School of Management. And I uh, hope you're all enjoying it so far. Keep tweeting.